The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, Community Solar. My name is Tim. I'm from Half Moon Education, and I'll be your moderator for today. Uh, today's webinar will run for three hours and 15 minutes, and we'll have one 15-minute break uh, around our halfway point. Uh, before we jump into our content, content we do just have a, a few notes to go over first. Uh, first, please be sure you're logged into the webinar using your own individual internet connection. Uh, this is me used as a means to prove attendance in the event that either you or Half Moon Education is audited by any any licensing board. Uh, in addition to being logged into your own computer, there will be a brief quiz at the end of the webinar. Um, it's just a short quiz. It's about five, six, seven questions long. It's not meant to catch anybody up. It's just meant to prove attendance. Um, if you don't want to take that quiz immediately after we conclude, you can access it in a follow-up email that will be sent approximately one hour after everything closes down today. Certificates of completion will be issued for each webinar you attend with us. Uh, they'll be sent via email within five business days of after, and after a quiz has been successfully submitted. Uh, if you need your certificate sooner for licensing purposes, you can either call into our office or you can reply back to any of the emails you received regarding any of the webinars and we can help you out. We'll be taking questions throughout today. On the right-hand side of your screen, there is a questions box. At any time you have a question for either Mr. Cromer or for Half Moon Education, type them in and we'll get them answered as soon as we can. Materials for today were emailed out earlier. If you didn't have a chance to download them, you can access them in the handout section on the right-hand side of your screen. There's a link to a PDF. Uh, when you click on that, it'll open up in your default internet explorer, or I'm sorry, default internet browser, um, where then you can print or download. All right, well, that's all I have. I'll now hand everything over to Mr. John Ross Cromer. He's an Ivy League mechanical engineer, a master electrician, a NABCEP certified PV installer, and author of Solar Power Design and Development, an Introduction to Rooftop Solar. Thanks, Chair. All right, thank you, Tim. Uh, let's see here. Thought I, had, thought I had it all queued up, but uh, let's see. Just to start out with, in the chat box, I put a link to my uh, Google Classroom. That's where I upload uh, course recordings, and um, and uh, you know we teach this class about once every four months, and it does get updated. So. You know, if you're interested in, in updates or course recordings or whatnot, just follow that link to the Google Classroom and, and put in the course code, and uh, and then you will get there. Uh, but this is our class on community solar. You've probably by now taken some other classes uh, related to solar power, hopefully from me. Uh, and this is going to be kind of more of a, a fun one. Um, and you might be thinking to yourself right now, well, you know, what will I, will I ever have a, a pragmatic need for a community solar class in terms of developing my own community solar program? You know, if you have that immediate need, please, uh, you know, indicate so in the, the chat box. And I'm happy to, to kind of tune the presentation into uh, to your immediate needs. Uh, but what I'm finding in my own practice, you know, right now I'm in Mississippi, and Mississippi does not have very good solar-friendly policy, um, and and it, you have to really reach to make uh, projects work. And what we're finding out when by studying community solar business models is that the uh, the community solar business model can actually result in a, a more profitable project for the developer um, or for the utility that partners uh, with the developer on this issue. And that's because uh, the buyers of community solar uh, are residential buyers who do not have other options to own solar power. They might rent, they might not have a very good rooftop, uh, but they still want to support the, the solar industry. And, uh, and, and these community solar participants, to kind of ruin the surprise, uh, they're more satisfied with a longer term payback uh, than most direct solar owners, where you know they might not be spending twenty thousand or thirty thousand dollars to put solar power on their rooftop, but if it's uh, you know in, in many cases, as we'll we'll soon find out, the community solar programs will actually not be economic for the participant, but because it might be five dollars a month or ten dollars a month, 
you know, really what we see is the community solar product um, replacing what used to be voluntary green energy sales. So what we're going to do today is um, better explore uh, the way green energy is transacted across the grid. Uh, then we'll look at some community solar case studies to see how uh, various utilities and, and investment groups have crafted community solar projects. And then we'll talk about, you know, what, what are some next steps and if you wanted to design your own community solar project. And, and that might be simply because you're already planning a large, uh, whether it be utility scale array or commercial rooftop array and uh, you just want to you know cash out the investors at the beginning of the project and transfer the uh, financial risk to um, I guess what you would call uh, long-term investors who are satisfied with a lower rate of return so what the heck does all that mean uh, well that's what we're going to get into uh, right now so uh why don't we just start out with kind of the, the industry definition of community solar uh sia is the solar industry energy industries association you know one of the the largest i'd say uh you know trade organizations in the United States for solar, you know, they do lobbying, you know, for they weigh in on import tariffs and tax credits and stuff like that. They define community solar as any shared renewable energy arrangement, which allows multiple electric customers to combine investments to provide renewable power and or financial benefits um, from one local renewable energy power plant. And I think the, the most impart, important um, word in this whole definition, actually two words, it's this and or. So what is this saying? It says, okay, well, multiple people are combining investments and we're getting renewable power and or financial benefit. And so that's one thing you have to keep in mind is that the community solar participants may not be receiving financial benefit for their participation. In fact, they, when you talk to community solar participants, many of them will say, oh yeah, you know, I, I might save some money. It might end up costing me some money. But what I really wanted to do was, was participate in bringing uh, a local solar power plant to my community. And so they do find participants who are just interested in the renewable power aspect and, and are kind of okay if the financial benefit is not there. Now, what we'll see, which is a little bit concerning, is whether or not they're actually getting the renewable power and, and that gets into more legalese, which will kind of demystify as we go along. Uh, but community solar is definitely a trend. In fact, uh, it's it's probably going to be a larger trend uh, moving on now that we have uh, the the import tariff. You know, we've had an import tariff in the solar industry for uh, a number of years now. It's just been kind of a, a game of whack-a-mole where you know one country gets an import tariff against them, so they move their operations to another country. Um, based on world trade organization laws and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, really to, to summarize the, where the import tariff is now coming down is, is essentially all solar modules coming into the United States are now being subject to an import tariff. Now, why is that important in the context of this class? Uh, we'll get to in a minute. Uh, before this concept of community solar, how did people participate in green energy markets or even what community options are there to come together and support solar power? Well, the first option is green power purchasing. 
you know, you may have an option from your utility to sign up for what they will call a 100% green or 100% renewable plan. Um, often it's not sourced by solar, often it's sourced by uh, wind power, sometimes it's sourced by the, the local hydroelectric dam and the utility, you know, not everyone considers hydro to be renewable, but, you know, the, the vendor does. So, um, and, and one trend in that is to say, well, and, and we'll explore this, but how do, you, how do you get this claim of green power purchasing without having the utility call the shot? So if the utility is selling you a, a green power plan, that would be a bundled plan. If uh, you're actually going and buying the, and they're not called this, but the term everyone thinks of is carbon credits, you know, can you go and, and source the carbon credits directly from the project and not uh, source them through the utility? And the answer is yes, you can. So, you know, and in some markets, particularly in deregulated markets, you know, now the trend is not just to buy the carbon credits from the projects, but to buy everything from the projects, all of the energy coming out of it. And so we'll talk about when that comes into effect. There's also a, a variety of organizations uh, that have tried to do group organization for bulk purchasing of materials. You know, there are some economies of scale to be had uh, in, in buying in bulk. And so uh, whether it's the solarized movement or one block off the grid in the past historically, that's, that's organizations coming together to kind of uh, pool their money and get some volume. Uh, discounting. Uh, companies like Solar City in the past have offered bond purchasing where you can give Solar City or Mosaic or some other uh, solar financial institutions, you can buy bonds that go to develop solar projects. And we'll look at one of those models uh, that I think is, is particularly interesting today towards the end of class. And then of course there's direct ownership, financing the direct ownership, or even you know not owning but having someone else own it, putting solar on your roof and effectively leasing the array. And that's not always the best economic deal for the customer, but sometimes your sales rep will tell you it is. And you know, I've often seen customers who get involved in solar leasing, it comes time to sell their house. And what they realize is just like if you lease a car and you need to get out of your leasing contract early, you know, leasing a car is more expensive than buying a car uh, on an annual basis. And with these 20 year solar leases, it can actually make your home more difficult to sell and you really don't get hardly any value out of that solar lease. Um, that's kind of a separate issue. It's being replaced by solar financing, where ownership is usually a little bit better. At the end of the day, it all comes down to, you know, not just, you know, I have I, I had one customer come my way where I was essentially the, the subcontractor building the solar array, and he got 20-year, 4% financing on his solar array, and that's great. You know, long-term, low-interest financing, that's absolutely something that we need in the industry. Uh, on the other hand, the company that sold him the array, they jacked up their prices. And so if he's buying a, a array that is, you know, 50% more expensive then it should be to give them a decent payback. You know, it doesn't really matter if he finances that that jacked up rate over 20 years at low interest, he's still overpaying and the solar array is not in his financial best interest. You know, there's there's some, uh, you know, as, as this industry develops, you know, we have to be increasingly aware of what I would call predatory sales practices um, particularly, I, I maybe it's because I'm in Mississippi, but when I'm a subcontractor on projects, um, you know, often I look at these prices and I look at the customers who think they're saving money, and I know they're not saving money because, you know, they they're not being presented a, a proper cash flow uh, by the company that sold them the array. 
So, you know, it's not all dark corners. I think there's one program that's actually been running since 2005 that I think is quite admirable, and you have to go all the way up to Fairbanks, Alaska to find it. So I actually only found out about this because a few years back I taught a live program in Fairbanks, and that's when I found out about this program. But what their local cooperative has done is they've taken a stance that many cooperatives do that say, look, you know, we're not going to buy your solar electricity at a premium. You know, our, our business is to deliver cheap electricity for our customers. If we buy your uh, solar electricity at a premium, then our rates will go up and that's not uh, the mission of our cooperative. Uh, but what they've done on the side is said, but we recognize there are both voluntary buyers of green energy and voluntary generators of green energy. You know, people who buy solar and export it onto the grid, even though they're not mandated to do so. You know, a lot of residential customers, uh, particularly if you're not getting a, a big fat rebate check from the utility, most of those are gone. Um, you know, you still have people who will buy solar, even if the payback is you know, 15 years down the road, they'll still do it to say, hey, this is just something that I want. Going back to this, this SNAP program, you know, basically what they, what the co-op does is says, well, if you want to be on a green energy plan, we'll add two cents a kilowatt hour to your bill, and then we'll source the green credits or the renewable energy credits from local solar array owners and provide them with a two cent a kilowatt hour incentive. And so they're using voluntary premiums paid for green energy to fund voluntary projects on their local grid. And that's really a, a good form of where the co-op is, is not increasing the price of their electricity on their non-participant, um, but also providing the framework for solar customers to receive a little bit of an incentive that might take that 15 year payback down to a 12 year payback. And that incentive is coming from voluntary customers who might wanna spend five or $10 a month to support local renewable energy, even though you know, they're, they're not receiving any economic payback on that. You know, that is, that is effectively a community solar program that's been on the market since 2005, um, but nobody necessarily calls it that. You know, that might be more technically, you might call that distributed community solar because it's not one array that everybody's supporting. It's dozens of arrays distributed throughout the community that everybody is supporting. And so the, the point of the matter is, is you don't have to have legal framework in place to develop a community solar program, but many states do. So, you know, Minnesota has a lot of community solar projects and they have active legislation for community solar. Uh, New York is the same way. Uh, their legislation is a little bit more new. Um, and, and so we do have this combination of states that support community solar legislation that drive community solar projects. We also see, you know, many states that don't have any community solar laws on the books. And in fact, some of these states don't even have net metering laws on the books. And yet you still will find community solar projects in the area. So why is that? You know, those are some concepts we're going to further flesh out here. Uh, so in general, you do see, you know, states passing community solar legislation and then the, the projects coming on board a little bit later on uh, down the line. And so, uh, you know, but, but then again, you know, here is Excel Energy in Colorado doing community solar ahead of the state legislation. And why would you want to do that? Well, you know, if you lead the process in your local area, you're more likely to be able to define the, uh, the program or the, the, the legalese that becomes the, the state policy 
a few years down the road. So you, you know, if you can get your particular community solar business model uh, integrated into state policy because they currently lack that state policy, that'll just set you up uh, for further business development. Now, this is, uh, I think, a, a very important slide. And, you know, it, the, the import tariff, to me, there's so many other more important issues in the solar industry that are not getting addressed. Um, you know, even for that matter, the, the way that we incentivize renewable energy through tax credits uh, is not necessarily the best way to go about incentivizing uh, a cleaner electric grid, uh, but that's, <laughs> government is not always about optimal policy, it's just about whatever sticks to the wall, and that's what we have um, right now. But if we go back a few years into 2015, you know, what happened in 2015 is the, the tax credit for solar was originally set to expire. And I actually think it was set to expire at the end of 2016. And so if it's 2015 and you think the tax credit is gonna expire at the end of 2016, and you had to guess at what's gonna happen to the solar market, well, you know, what the studies were, were suggesting is that on-site solar was gonna level off if the tax credit went away, and that you would have to have these economies of scale to get more solar growth out of the ground. And so in absence, uh, in absence of the tax credit, community solar was looked at as the next way to grow the solar industry. So, you know, there's, there's some... Um, there are economies of scale to be had on large projects versus small projects. And so, um, you know, maybe without the tax credit, um, maybe without the tax credit, they, um, maybe without the tax credit, they, they, um, yeah, sorry about that. Maybe without the tax credit, they could not do residential solar in a cost-effective manner. But if they could decrease the project cost by 50% by doing one large community array, uh, then, then that might reduce the cost to the point where the participation would be cost-effective. At the same time, that really relies on participation from the utility. So I'm not saying that this is this is necessarily what's happening happening in today's market. You know, I actually think that the the import tariff is going to pop the utility scale model. Um, but most community solar projects are not utility scale projects. You know, back in back in 2012, maybe a one megawatt or a five megawatt project would be considered. Um, utility scale, but nowadays it's more like 100 megawatts would be utility scale. Um, every state has the right to set its own electric policy. Uh, this actually is an issue that goes back much further than the solar industry, back into uh, the Commerce Clause, which is an unspoken kind of a constitutional uh, delegation of powers that says the federal government is not going to step into interstate commerce unless that commerce also occurs outside of, uh, you know, in occurs between countries and not just between states. And so historically, interstate commerce has been left to, you know, each state to govern, and that includes electricity sales. And what that means is that every state has their own public utility commission, every state has their own unique set of uh, energy regulations, and that can frustrate a solar installer who does business in multiple states, but at the same time, it's very difficult to overcome those hurdles because, um, you know, you would, you would to, in order to have, say, a, a federal net metering law or a federal community solar infrastructure, you would have to not just be rewriting the rules of, you know, not only the electric sector, 
but also, you know, other industries involving interstate commerce that don't have anything to do with energy sales at all. So, you know, if you can't beat them, join them. You know, what we have to do to develop community solar is to understand how um, your community solar project might change based on your own state uh, rules and regulations. Uh, therefore, we have uh, this article by Green Tech Media. It's a very good um, kind of leading media outlet for green industry news. And this article is just saying that you know every state has different green energy policies, and therefore every community solar program is going to be a little bit different. I actually like that because it means that someone who understands the nuances of your local state laws and regulations has a good chance of writing a successful community solar program. Whereas, uh, you know, if, if business models that are only driven towards one size fits all solutions across the entire country uh, might find a little bit more difficulty to develop those projects at a local level. So let's take a step back for a minute. Let's, uh, let's talk about what is the, the atom, what is the fundamental unit of green energy sales? I mean, we have this kind of weird issue, you know, because of pollution, you know, power plants do pollute. And because of pollution, we locate our power plants outside the city. And so if we connect, say, a, a wind turbine to the grid and a community solar array to the grid or a utility-scale solar project to the grid, and here's a, a nuclear plant and a coal plant and a hydro plant, they're all tied into the transmission and distribution of the grid. But we can't track the electrons. You know, if, if this one small home buyer says, I want to be on the green energy plan, you know, they cannot actually deliver the electrons from the solar array to the home itself. You know, it's like you, it's like a bucket and you pour all the energy from your solar farm and all the energy from your coal plant into the same bucket, which is the electric grid. And then everybody gets the same energy content out. And so even though you're on a 100% renewable plan, your physical electricity that's physically delivered to your site is not 100% renewable. Instead, there is a, a, you know, an agreement that the utility says, well, you're supporting an equivalent amount of renewable production. And if it's not going to your specific home, it might be going somewhere else, but that green production has made it to the grid somewhere based on the amount of money that you've supported, based off the number of customers enrolled, based off state mandates, uh, a wide variety of other topics. Now, all that said, one thing that is unique about a, a community solar project as opposed to, a, say, a wind farm or a hydroelectric dam is that you can actually locate the community solar project closer to the home. So as far as what green energy product, whether it's a, a voluntary wind purchase or a voluntary green power purchase, you know, it's, it's the community solar purchases that will actually bring that renewable electricity closer to home. And so, you know, if you are, if you are voluntarily increasing your electric bill to support renewable energy, there might be value in having that green energy be produced locally rather than, you know, eight states away, a thousand miles away. And, and physically, if you have more renewable content on your grid, um, you know, you are physically pushing out more dirt forms of energy um, from that grid. So how have we tracked this in the past? Well, it's in the United States, and you can thank Texas for coming up with this system. So you really don't think Texas as a state that supports cap and trade, but somewhat ironically, Texas led the movement to develop cap and trade. 
you know, they, they did it to get their wind industry off of the ground. And it was uh, quite a successful program. But they came up with this, this, this product called a REC, which stands for a Renewable Energy Credit or a Renewable Energy Certificate. And what they say is, okay, under a, a REC-based renewable exchange, you know, you have your coal going into the grid, your nuclear going into the grid, your solar, your wind going into the grid. And what they're going to do is just treat all of that electricity the same. And so your, your power purchase agreements, your energy supply contracts, they all come based in kilowatt hours. And in order to value the renewable component of that electricity, they say, we're not going to value it under the, the same ways that we that we transact electricity, what we're going to do is we're going to separate it from the rest of our energy transactions and create a imaginary product called a rack. And every time you generate a thousand kilowatt hours of renewable electricity, you are able to claim a rack. So um, a, a 10 kilowatt solar array, you go into PV watts and you learn that it'll generate 14,000 kilowatt hours of electricity. You know, that solar array would generate 14 wrecks a year. You know, a, a, a major wind farm or a utility scale solar plant will generate, you know, thousands of wrecks a year. Uh, a small, um, residential solar array may only generate you know a half dozen wrecks a year and actually some of the solar incentives in years past whenever you've gotten a check from the utility for putting solar on your home you know the utilities have called it a rebate and sometimes that has created some some confusing tax issues on whether or not that rebate is a subsidy and therefore, you have to back that subsidy out of the cost basis of the solar array before you can take your tax credit. So if you, you buy a $70,000 solar array and you get a $50,000 check from the utility, you can only take your 30% tax credit on the remaining $20,000. That's a $6,000 tax credit because you can't take a tax credit on what you didn't pay for. But what's confusing is that $50,000 check from the utility has not been a true subsidy. Instead, it's been a rep purchase, almost like they're buying the mineral rights to your solar array. Most solar incentives of years past have been renewable energy credit purchasing rights, even if the program administrators have put solar rebate on the top of the form down at the bottom of the form, it says, by getting this check, you agree to transfer all of your renewable energy credits over the utility. You know, that's not a subsidy, that's a purchase. And the utilities, maybe they've put rebate at the top of the form because they want, haven't wanted to go through the process of issuing all of their customers the appropriate tax documents to, to you know, properly account for all of that that money being exchanged. But, you know, you, you look at it this way, if I'm a, a solar customer in Austin, Texas in 2009, and I buy a $70,000 solar array, I take a 30% tax credit on that, and that's a $20,000 tax credit. Then I get a $50,000 rec purchase from the utility, and I basically generated a return on my investment before the array has generated a dime. Um, whereas one issue that was occurring back in the day was accountants weren't sure if you would write the, the tax credit to be the total project cost or the total project cost minus the utility check because of this issue you know it's is it is it a, a subsidy or is it a rec purchase now a, a separate issue is that often these utility solar incentives have grossly overvalued the solar recs to the point where you have a, a system in texas where um, customers were getting utility checks of tens of thousands of dollars for their solar renewable energy credits um, 
but the, the wind renewable energy credits were so cheap in Texas that it would actually be cheaper for the utility not to do anything with the solar wrecks and when it came time to meet their state mandated goals just to go and buy the wind wrecks instead. If you don't know what any of that means, we're going to rehash it again over the next few slides. But the point is, whenever in the United States, your, your renewable system generates renewable energy, you get to claim renewable energy credits. So the question becomes, well, how do I do this? And what we have to remember is the RECs are tracked by the same unit that all other electricity sales are tracked by. And so as long as you are monitoring the production of your solar array, as long as you're monitoring the outflow, if you generate you know, 12,567 kilowatt hours of renewable energy, that entitles you to claim 12,567 kilowatt hours of renewable energy credit. Whether or not you can find a buyer for that wreck is a completely different issue. But you know, sometimes customers say, well, if I didn't get a, a rebate check from my utility, if there's no wreck market in my area, then, then do I even have these wrecks? And the answer is yes, you do. And then the next question would be, well, can I sell these wrecks? And the, the, the answer is yes, you can. But then it becomes, a, a, you know, finding a buyer is the hard part. Um, so RECs are used for two reasons. They're used by utilities to meet state-mandated requirements. And if you go to the Desire website, you can look up what's called a renewable portfolio standard and figure out how many RECs your utility is mandated to buy each year. And... Theoretically, you could take your 12 recs down to the utility and say, hey, I want to sell you these. They're probably going to tell you to get lost because they're buying tens of thousands of recs to meet these goals and not just 12. Um, so then you might say, well, who else can I sell them to? And then we, that brings us back to these voluntary green power buyers. And just like we saw in in um, Golden Valley Electric up in Alaska, you know, you can find voluntary buyers for RECs and voluntary generators for RECs and connect them together to make that transaction happen. And I would call that a community solar product, even if it doesn't fit the official definition. Um, but it, it does take a little bit of elbow grease to do it. So all renewables get renewable energy credits, and then solar renewable energy credits are designated as an SREC. And sometimes states will, will take their renewable mandates and carve them up and say, this much needs to come from wind, this much needs to come from solar, this much needs to come from hydro or whatever, and, and then the rest can come from any of them. You know, or sometimes they don't make any official distinguishment between the two. So again, it's it's a state by state case. And what that leads to is massive price fluctuations in the renewable energy credit market. And that that can be very confusing to a customer. So let's uh you know, how would you sell a rack? Well, there are brokers online where you can go online and you know srectrade.com. I've, I've never used them, but I've followed them for years because they publish their pricing, you know, what they're selling their RECs for. They update on their website for the various REC markets. And, you know, these brokers are primarily interested in targeting these brokers. <laughs> Hold on one second. Um, these these brokers are primarily interested in um, targeting the most lucrative market. So if you're in a market and you say, well, are my SRECs valuable? 
you know, I would recommend just hopping on to srectrade.com and checking out what markets they participate in, and that's going to tell you your answer pretty quickly. Now, Texas is a market where the, the solar renewable energy credits are not valuable. And so the, the question would be, okay, well, what if I want to sell a wreck in Texas? You know, let's say I found a buyer for my wrecks. I've, I've done all my homework. I have my green power generators. I have the buyers who want to buy the wrecks. How would I do that? Well, you don't necessarily have to use the state exchange, but you can. You know, as part of your interconnection agreement, that is a document that says this solar array is interconnected at this address. And in, in Texas, that interconnection agreement um, registers your solar array with the state of Texas. And if you want to, you can go onto the state of Texas's renewable website and log your production and say, I'm entitled to this many renewable energy credits. And, um, and, and also, in, in, in the way in Texas works, it's, they don't make any of this data public. So it's really more of just a directory of REC owners and REC holders. And so if you have a bunch of RECs, if you're a solar fleet manager and you want to sell the RECs of your customers, it may be worthwhile just to go to your state exchange and, and put your name out there as a whatever the term is. In Texas, they call it a micro aggregator. You know, it's worthwhile just to go and register because then people might contact you who are buyers. You know, so there are state regulatory frameworks that you can use to document, to network, to transact, even if you're not necessarily um, interested in providing RECs to the mandate market. Um, or in, in other grids where the, the RECs might have a, a $20 or $30 value, you can just go to the exchange and, um, and, and maybe sell them directly on the exchange. You know, you have to keep in mind that every electric grid is different, and so every state REC exchange is going to be a little bit different. But, you know, the, the fundamentally, if you have an interconnection agreement and you have an online monitoring system, that is enough for you to say, I have a REC. And then if you want to go and sell that REC to a compliance market, you got to go and register either with a broker or directly onto the state exchange. You don't necessarily have to register with the state exchanges if you want to sell your RECs to a voluntary market. But at the same time, it's useful to, to say, hey, I'm here and I have RECs for sale. And so just listing yourself on the state exchange, even if you're not using it to transact your REC business may be a good idea. Now, most solar customers in historically have not done any of this because they directly participate in utility incentive programs, um, and then the utility goes in and does all this stuff behind the scenes. So we'll look at some of this stuff a little bit later. Now, you may say, well, I didn't think, you know, we're, what we're talking about with RECs, it sounds a lot like cap and trade. And uh, what may surprise some to learn is that even though we don't have a federal cap and trade program, most states across the country have state cap and trade programs. And so cap and trade does exist in the United States. It's just not run at the federal level. It's left to the individual states to set their own rules and administer. And, and that, that could mean that you have very states with very aggressive cap and trade type programs, like the, the state of New York, for example, you know, they want to be 50% green by 2030. In California, you know, they want to be 50% green by 2030, I think something like 100% by 2050. And other states do it differently. You know, Texas, you know, that one state that kicked it all off kind of ironically 
Well, it begins to make a little bit more sense when you realize that uh, you know by by creating this cap and trade market in Texas, you know what they really did was set the bar really low, and so it's really easy in the state of Texas for a utility to meet all of the cap and trade requirements. And so, uh, you know, the, the 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 point is in Texas there is a cap and trade system, but the requirements are so low. It, it hardly adds any kind of cost, and it's also not very effective either. Texas has some of the worst air quality uh, in the United States, and I say this as someone who grew up in Texas. So, you know, I, I love Texas. Uh, <laughs> I don't necessarily like their air quality, but, you know, that's how they do it. And so, you know, you have to operate within the, the context of your local area. From a consumer perspective, you know, you're really just concerned about, well, how much money do I get for my recs? And what this might mean is in states like New Jersey and Massachusetts, you have rec prices that are perhaps above the price of electricity itself. So in New Jersey, the price of electricity is around 17 cents a kilowatt hour. And so if I'm paying 17 cents a kilowatt hour for my electricity and I go and I put solar on my rooftop, I'm going to save at 17 cents a kilowatt hour. But then if I go and I sell my RECs, I'm going to get an additional 24 cents a kilowatt hour. And so my total is going to be like 41 cents a kilowatt hour. And what that means is that the REC price is actually worth more than the electricity itself and of course that you know that that sets itself up for attack um you know the idea is that eventually it stimulates so much growth that there's an oversupply compared to what the requirement is and then that will drive down the price of the rex down to less now in other states their their compliance mandates are a lot more easily achieved. And what that means is that while there is a REC market and a REC exchange, say, in Ohio, you don't get 24 cents for your REC. You only get a penny. And so it's, it's a much less lucrative market. Um, perhaps that's also one that has more public support, although uh, a lot of these programs... Uh, Let's just move on. <laughs> so monitoring is very important for green energy transactions. Monitoring is very important for REC transactions. And so the next question is, well, what type of monitoring do you need? You know, your, your solar inverter has an online monitoring system built into it. But when I've got the utility rebate for solar in the past, the utility has often required a secondary meter for logging all of the solar production. And so your electric service would actually have two meters, one for the solar array, and then you land on your service panel in a separate meter for you know, what goes in and out of your facility. And, and that's a common mistake that solar owners make. You know, they say, you know, I got a call uh, last year from a customer who said, you know, John, you know, it looks like to me the solar array is only producing one third of what you said it would because I'm getting my utility bill and what they say they got in terms of solar, what they bought back from me is is far less than what you projected. And what he wasn't taking into account was that two thirds of his electricity was being consumed on site and only one third of it was being exported to the grid. You know, so, so your utility meter on the side of your building only monitors inflow and outflow. It's not gonna monitor all of the energy that comes out of the array. Now your solar inverter monitors all the energy that comes out of the array. But sometimes utilities say, no, we want you to install a second meter. 
And that has led to this kind of uh, debate over what is the purpose of that second meter if the, the inverter is already capturing this data. And most in the solar industry believe that it's a matter of accuracy. They'll say, oh, the meter inside your inverter is only 95% accurate, whereas the, the meter from the utility is purportedly 99.5% accurate. And so they want that higher degree of accuracy to participate in the state exchange. And that's not, that's not the whole picture. Um, in fact, your your inverter, some of your inverter manufacturers now will offer an upgraded monitoring system that is as accurate as the utility grade meter. And even in those cases, the utility may say, no, we want you to put a second meter on it anyway. And that's just because they want everything to be on the same system. So the utility is rolling their trucks, and now these smart meters will transmit radio signals, and so the, the truck that's rolling by will pick up the, the, the signal, and they just want to collect all the data as they roll by. So they're not going to get that from the, the inverter. They have to get that from a utility meter. So you know, if the utility is requiring you to put a secondary meter just on the solar array itself, it usually has more to do with data collection rather than um, accuracy. The monitoring systems in the, the solar array are, are accurate enough. It's just not on the same system as what the utility wants. You know, on the on the other hand, I talked with the utility doing a community solar project, and I asked them, well, are you giving the RECs to the community solar purchasers? And this one utility said, well, we would, but we don't know how to do that. And that was, you know, they, they, were, not, they were in Virginia, so they didn't have a, a state compliance market of any, sub, of any substance that they had to participate in. So they really didn't have a reason to hold on to the RECs. And they were more than willing to give them to their community solar participants, but they didn't know how. Well, you know, here is an example of an electric bill of a customer who was on a voluntary green energy plan. And you can see it's the Nevada green energy rider. And this, this customer has consumed 1,036 kilowatt hours of electricity. Let me see if I can zoom in on this. There we go. So the, the customer has consumed 1,036 kilowatt hours of um, electricity, and then that electricity was sold to them at about 10 cents a kilowatt hour. And then on the next line, you see the green energy rider, and you know for every kilowatt hour that they've consumed, the utility is tracking on a four cent premium to the bill. And so this customer is being sold a 100% green energy plan at a four cent premium. And for whatever reason, they've decided that's what they want to do. Now, why would you want to do this? Well, if you're a residential homeowner, you might simply do this because you want to support the environment. You know, there's a lot of people out there who disagree with uh, federal and state green energy policy to the point where they will pay a little bit more each month to personally meet what they feel should be their green energy goals. So whether that's a, a real concern, an emotional concern, a political concern, you know, let's kind of push that all under the rug for now and just say these customers do exist. But there's also customers that have a, a, a more economic motive for being powered by green energy. You know, the, the Whole Foods grocery store chain. You walk into their store, and on the side of their store, they say, we are 100% powered by renewable energy. Well, if you want to say, well, how do you prove that? Well, it's right here in the electric bill. You know, they're, they're getting this wreck. They're getting 1,036 wrecks. They're buying it for this price. So if anyone were ever to challenge their claim to say, 
you know, hey, you're getting the same electricity as me, so why do you get to claim that you're legally powered by green energy, whereas I can't? Well, let's say I live right next door to a wind farm. All of my electricity is going to come from that wind farm, whether or not I buy green energy or not. So I suppose I could say, yeah, I'm wind powered. But if I don't live right next to a wind farm, I can't say that. You know, this this you know Whole Foods puts that into their marketing, and the way they substantiate their claims is being able to show a receipt for these renewable energy credits. And so how do you transact a renewable energy credit? Well, you register the facility with your interconnection application. So your, your facility is legally allowed by the state to be interconnected to the grid and pumped into the grid. And then you monitor the energy to say, I generated this much energy and then the last part of the equation is simply to have a, a document of the transaction to say, and here's your receipt where I have sold you this many renewable energy credits and you have bought this many renewable energy credits. So this whole process of renewable energy credit sales is, is actually quite simple. And it's, it's something that anyone with a solar array could participate in provided that they had a buyer and that's you know that's the hard part all right let's go on to the next slide here so uh, you know this this gets into some monitoring decisions on how are you going to monitor it um, but this is what I think is is particularly uh, interesting. You go into some of the state exchanges for what they require for monitoring. And so the utility may be telling you, oh, we need a, a, a dedicated meter for your solar array that is utility grade so that it is accurate enough for rec logging and rec selling and rec purchasing. But in reality, that is simply so that they can collect the data on their truck rolls. If you go into the, the brass tax on these state exchanges, so on an earlier slide, we saw that uh, DC is a state that has a high-valued renewable energy credit. And in DC, they say facilities that are less than 10 kilowatts, and so that's, that's most residential arrays are less than 10 kilowatts, in the state of D.C., you can claim renewable energy credits based off your PV watts calculation. So we've seen that in other classes. You just hop online to PV watts, you put in your array size and your location, and it estimates how much energy you're going to produce. And, and for D.C., they say, well, that's good enough. You know, you're a, a small time, you know, you're not even a potato farmer, you're a bean farmer. You don't, you don't have hardly any renewable energy credits. So even if you were fraudulently claiming them, you know, the issue is too small for us to even care about. You know, the, the, you know we're going to save so much money uh, and have so much less regulation by just, you know, logging renewable production on PV watts estimates that that's fine for arrays that are under 10 kilowatts. If you're larger than that, then yes, you're going to need a, a more accurate meter. And so that's kind of funny to me because everyone in the solar industry is like, well, it's a difference between a 95% accurate meter and a 98.5% accurate meter. But then on the state exchange, you know, your PV watt estimate could be off by 15% just based on whether or not you had a hurricane that year or not. And so, you know, accuracy is not the, the reason why you, you monitor these things. It's more about reporting. And so in other states like uh, Delaware, you know, you do need that revenue grade meter, but it could come from your inverter or it could come from a utility meter. Um, and, you know, so so there's a lot of states here in, in Maryland. It could be on PV watts in Texas. 
It could be on P.V. Watts in, uh, in, in Pennsylvania. It could be off P.V. Watts. So there's a lot of these state exchanges that <laughs> do not necessarily have the same level of uh, accuracy in their reporting requirements as your utility might tell you. Now, so in New Jersey, one of the more expensive um, uh, rec markets, you can do an estimate based off PV watts. You know, that doesn't give you a license to go out and fraudulently claim renewable energy credits. I mean, you can get audited if you're, you're claiming renewable energy production and receiving monetary compensation for it, but you're not actually producing that energy that actually is fraud and you can get in trouble for it. Um, but, but, but what we can see is that they're a little bit more relaxed in, in the reporting of renewable energy credits, at least at the residential level, than, than what your solar installer might think. Now, green power purchasing is actually quite large. There's a lot of people who do it. Between the, the corporate green power purchasing, you know, a lot of colleges, a lot of big businesses with corporate sustainability plans, um, all federal buildings, um, you, you get points from the U.S. Green Building Council for LEED certification for buying renewable energy credits. And, and then the other about half of the market is residential voluntary purchasing that comprises about two percent of all electricity sales and so if you look at say the the community solar market you say okay well some of these two percenters are going to end up putting solar on their rooftops instead but but not everyone can put solar on their roof simply because they might not have the right roof for it and so what that suggests is maybe 1% of all electricity sales in the United States could be community solar sales. And right now, you know, in, in the U.S., about 2% of our energy is solar. And as far as residential solar, it's even less than that. And so there is room for growth as for the community solar product. And at, at a bare minimum, Community solar could probably be about 1% of our electricity sales without having any kind of, of subscription issues. So you can be fully subscribed in your area if you don't have uh, solar penetration that is equal to 2%. So if your solar penetration is less than 2% in your area, in Mississippi, it's 0.01%. So we're not even on the radar and, and when you look at the states across the country, you know, usually Mississippi's at the bottom of the list, but really it's like 40 out of 50 states are at the bottom of the list, all in the same group. And it's like California and New Jersey and these other states that we've seen mentioned that are way up at the top doing like 6% solar, 7% solar, and bringing up the national average. So what this suggests is that in most of the country, there is an appetite for community solar at this time. And in the past, this, this desire to purchase voluntary green energy has not been served by community solar, but instead has been served by, um, let's see if I can get this task bar out of the way, uh, but has instead been served by uh, uh, voluntary green energy sales. And so that could be, uh, there's a couple of different ways to buy these recs. You can buy them from the utility. You can buy them in unbundled markets. Um, in deregulated markets, you might have people um, just going ahead and bundling them into their standard offer as a way of attracting customers to say, hey, we're the same price as your other provider, but we're 20% green, whereas the other provider might be 5% green. So come over to us instead because we're better for the environment. You know, that's called a community choice aggregation. And then an, another trend recently is, is just direct purchasing of green power in deregulated markets. I don't know as much about that. Uh, and then there's a, a standard for voluntary green energy sales called the Green E National Standard. 
And Greeny is a, a, you know, it's not a governmental institution. It's a private certification. Um, when federal buildings require renewable energy credit purchasing, they adhere to the green energy standard. They say you have to have green E or equivalent. And if you go to the Green E website, they'll actually, uh, you know, have rules and regulations that you can pour through. We'll take a look at that in a little bit. You know, here's an example, Alabama Power. So even in Alabama, you can buy renewable energy credits. And you go and you read the brass tax. Here's Alabama's plan. Each rec is $15. And it's billed at $1.25 per month for 12 months. So the way that you buy green energy in Alabama is you, you call them up and you say, I want to buy one renewable energy credit. And they divide it up over 12 months and bill you about $25 a month for it. And so you don't necessarily have to do 100%. You could do less than 100%. But when you look at a $15 REC, and by and large, when we talk about a REC, we're talking about 1,000 kilowatt hours of renewable energy production. So $15 REC divided by 1,000 kilowatt hours, that comes out to be 1.5 cents a kilowatt hour. Now, the, the price of electricity in Alabama is 11 cents a kilowatt hour. And so when you buy this rack for one and a half cents, you're effectively adding a 10% a premium onto your bill. Except that you don't necessarily need to do 100% of the bill. And so, you know, it... it you know, that, that, you know, increasing your electric bill by 10% is not something that most people want to do, but maybe increasing your bill by $1.25 a month to help the environment is something that, uh, eh, why not? Hey, it's a, well, I like the environment. I participate in the environment. So dollar a month, sure, why not? Well, here's another company. This is in Indianapolis, Indianapolis Power and Light. So, uh, you know, Indiana does, is not big on renewable mandates. They don't have solar incentives. I'm not even sure if they have net metering. But here's Indianapolis Power and Light, and you go into their, their rates, rules, and regulations, and you look up their, their riders, and eventually you get to Rider 21, the, the Green Power Initiative. And this is a rider that can be added to their residential service, their commercial services. You know, it, it can be just tacked on to their other customers. And let me pull up the, the fine print here. There we go. Uh, So here's Indianapolis Power and Light. They can do 25% of their bill. They can do 50% of their bill. They can do 100% of their bill. But what I think is most fascinating about all of this is the rate is a tenth of a penny a kilowatt hour. So in other words, you have... Alabama Power, and when I say Alabama Power, this is typical of most utilities. So most utilities are selling their voluntary recs for around one and a half cents a kilowatt hour. But here's Indianapolis Power and Light selling their recs for a tenth and a penny. And like, so why is that? You know, if, if I went to Indiana and their electricity was one tenth the price of here in Mississippi, well, shoot, I'd move there because that's dirt cheap electricity. So why in Indianapolis are the recs a tenth of a penny, whereas in Alabama, buying them from the utility, they're a penny and a half. So I buy them from one utility and another, and the price difference ranges by, you know, a, a thousand percent. Well, we're going to come back to that. 
there's a concept in renewable energy credit markets called REC retirement. And so the, the Green E concept uses REC retirement. When you buy a renewable energy credit from the utility, you may not actually physically receive any kind of documentation that says the transaction occurred other than your printout on your electric bill. And so I think that this is kind of dangerous because if I sign up for a green energy plan and then I call up my utility and I say, okay, I bought these RECs, where did they come from and can I resell them? You know, they'll say, no, you can't resell them because we actually don't transfer the ownership of the REC to you. We retire it from our system so that it can't be bought or resold. And while that is a, a noble cause, it also requires trust that the utility is actually documenting and managing this process and not just saying they are. Because if I call them and I say, well, where's my wreck coming from? They might tell me, oh, it comes from wind in West Texas. But if I say, no, which exact wind farm, you know, which exact turbine, what day, what time was my wreck generated? And I might want that information so that I can put it up online. And if anyone else was given the same information, we would know that the utility wasn't being honest. But without that kind of receipt, we have to trust that the utility is being honest without anything but their word. And so that's a, that's a, that's a problem. There have been instances of utilities, um, I'm not trying to say that they're double selling their recs, but they're not tracking them to the degree of accuracy that the customer might want. And so at the, at the very least, that is a weakness in the utility rec product. You know, at least if I'm a community solar participant, I can drive down the road and see the solar array that I'm supporting. You know, I can't necessarily see my support so tangibly with a traditional voluntary green power purchase product. But this, this concept of rec retirement where the utility is actually selling you the rec but not transferring it to you, you know, that's that's written into the Greeny program. So the, the national standard that everyone follows for, for recs, you know, you go and you read the legalese and they have all these rules about double counting but no supply chain tracking to make sure that the double counting is not occurring. But you can go to the Greeny website and pull up their, you know, what's called the, the national standard and read through it to get all the, the rules and regulations of rec laws. And there's, there's some pretty interesting stuff there that, you know, to some people might be controversial to other people and may say, well, you just have to have it be like that for business. But what I'm talking about is, you know, recs can be generated last year and sold to the customer this year. RECs can be sold to the customer this year and generated next year. So you could actually be buying RECs that don't actually exist yet. And so at the very least, that, that invites mur additional murkiness into the supply chain. But looking up the rules of Green E, we can interpret the spirit of what is and is not supposed to happen in a voluntary green energy transaction. And so this is what the standards have been since voluntary green energy came to market as a product. And basically the, the, the fundamental tenet is that you can't double count, which means that the REC is sold by one party to another party, that includes any express or implied environmental claims. So if I'm selling a rec to Whole Foods and Whole Foods is saying we are 100% powered by green energy, the utility cannot use the same production to say we are 100% valued by renewable energy because Whole Foods has taken that claim. In fact, in the Texas market, historically, they tried to do that. So you get into the compliance markets, there are actually compliance mandates 
And then some states will call their mandates a voluntary mandate, which means that their mandate can be met with voluntary sales. And so that when the customer is participating in a voluntary mandate market, they are, voluntar they are volunteering to increase their electric bill by 10% to be 100% green. But the utility is turning around and saying, we're also 100% green for that portion. And so does that actually spur investment or not? You know, that would be called double counting. And so, you know, the, the spirit of double counting is saying only one party can make the environmental claims of green energy when you're selling green energy. And so if you're, you know, when the same wreck is used by a utility to meet environmental mandates, such as a renewable portfolio standard, and is also used to satisfy customer voluntary sales, that would be considered not allowed in traditional green energy markets. And, and you would think that that would be kind of common sense. In fact, if you've participated in a solar program in the past, you may have gotten a document from, their, from the utility that tells you what you can and cannot say about your solar array. So in the Tennessee Valley Authority region, which North Mississippi is a part of, when you participate in their residential solar program, you are agreeing to sell all of the RECs to the TVA. And so they give you a document that says, you know, you can say that we are supporters of green energy. You can say that we increase green energy on the grid by selling it to the TVA as part of their program. You can say that we, we supply green energy for green power, for their voluntary green power purchasing program. You can claim that you have a solar array on your rooftop that's sold to the TVA. What you cannot say, if you get a rebate check from the utility for your solar power, you cannot say that you are solar powered because you have sold that right to the utility. So that, that, that is kind of strange too. You know, the solar array may be on your rooftop, but if you're a business and you have solar on your roof, but you've taken that money from the utility and they have bought your renewable energy credits in exchange for that, you would not be allowed to claim that you are a solar powered business. What you would then have to do is, is go back and buy additional RECs to offset your energy use because you know, you've, you've sold the ones you're generating. Now, why is all this stuff important? It's probably not important to y'all, but to someone who, who studies this stuff and says, well, you know, why can't we connect all the dots together so voluntary purchases or funding voluntary investors? Um, you know, you, you might ask, well, how much money are utilities making on voluntary green energy purchases? And if you look at the national average pricing for these renewable energy credit programs, and this might be important because you might be trying to develop your own community solar program and you don't know how to price it in order to get participation. So how much, how much more will a customer voluntarily increase their electric bill to support green energy? And we're not talking about all customers, but the customers who do this are, you know, whether it's residential, you know, or commercial, you know, what we see is like, here's Indianapolis Power and Light right there at a tenth of a penny. So that's their product and they get high participation because it's so cheap. But most customers are willing to spend between one and two cents a kilowatt hour more on their electricity in order for it to come from renewable resources. So coming back to that Indianapolis Power and Light, how is Indianapolis Power and Light able to sell RECs for a tenth of a penny when most RECs are selling for a penny to two pennies? 
And it all comes down to the difference between price and cost. And so when you go on to these state exchanges, so you don't buy your RECs from the utility, but you go to the state exchange, you find a generator who has RECs, and you buy the RECs from them. Usually these are large wind farms. Well, the national average price on utility scale exchanges, which anyone can participate in, but they're, you know, they're, that's, these, are the, these are kind of the wholesale markets for renewable energy credits. The average price is a tenth of a penny. Or in other words, the average cost from a utility provided to retail customer green energy purchaser the utility on average is buying the rec for a tenth of a penny and in indianapolis power and lights case they're simply just passing it at cost onto their customer but for all of the alabama powers out there who are selling their recs at a penny and a half to their customers they could be buying the recs for a tenth of a penny and selling them for a penny and a half, putting a 94% profit margin on the voluntary green energy package, which means that these voluntary rec sales that have a murky supply chain and very poor supply chain tracking are also the most profitable product that a utility has to sell to a customer. And hardly anyone cares because it's just a you know, small niche market segment for environmental altruists. But what that means is that environmental altruists, for every dollar they give the utility to spend on green energy products, only five cents on average makes it into the green power project. And so if I'm handing a dollar to a power company to support green energy, because that power company is primarily in the business of brown energy, and I say, okay, so here's a dollar to go use on green projects, and they keep 95 cents and they spend five cents to support green energy. And to put it nicely, I'm being ripped off. And so when I look at that, I, I, the, the, without trying to get more political on it, what I would say is that the voluntary renewable energy product that serves 2% of America today is a very weak product. And what is replacing it is a much stronger community solar product where the bulk of that money actually makes it into the project. And so I, I fully expect that in the future, we're going to see these voluntary green power plans kind of fade away and community solar take over that market. Because from a consumer perspective, even if they don't understand all of that, you know, they do understand being able to drive down the street and see the project rather than just, you know, throwing their money out the window and hoping it improves the environment somehow. A lot of these more lucrative rec markets are up on the East Coast. We've talked about some of this already, so I'm just kind of accelerating it a little bit further. Yeah, the, the, the issue is you may need to start taking matters into your own hands if you, if you want to see this, this process fixed. And what we're going to talk about towards the end of the program is how uh, blockchain you know, the same technology that drives Bitcoin. There's actually a blockchain out there for solar power where you can be logging your solar production, you know, listing your recs for sale, and people can search the blockchain to find you and buying your recs. Um, you know, let's, let's just, you know, here's a, a Texas, I talked to this Texas windmill museum 
And they're, they're called the uh, American Windmill Museum in Lubbock, Texas. And Lubbock is in North Texas where there's a lot of wind power. And so I asked them, well, do you have any, you know, are you selling your wrecks? And they say, well, we really don't know how to. We haven't had anyone ask us to buy them. I said, well, you know, would you would you sell your wrecks for a dollar a wreck or a, a tenth of a penny, you know, the same price as these larger projects? And they said, yeah, you know, because we're not getting any value for them now. We have one uh, turbine on our property that's a, a grid connected turbine and that will generate about 500 wrecks a year so of course if someone wants to write me a check for 500 bucks i'd gladly sell them my wrecks you know from my turbine so there is opportunity to connect these buyers and sellers but because they're so small it's hard to do You know, one thing that um, we're going to talk about the, the solar coin blockchain kind of towards the end of it. Uh, but one idea, just since we're here on this slide, is okay, well, let's go back to that concept of Whole Foods. You know, Whole Foods right now says we're 100% green powered and people like that. But what if they spent the same amount of money not buying these ambiguous wind wrecks out of town? But instead of being 100% powered, they were only 5% green powered, but they source all of their wrecks locally. And so that their green investment, instead of going into, you know, what is essentially a dog and pony show, if instead they use that same money to incentivize local solar in a way that gave them even greater marketing value, because now that local solar array owner says, Hey, Whole Foods just bought my renewable energy credits. You know, that would be a, a community solar product that uh, might be a better use of their budget. You know, so there's a lot of innovation potential in this market. And uh, without getting into the brass tacks of it now, there's a, a blockchain out there that can start helping, you know, at least at the very least logging the data so that the data is there. Uh, for use down the road. Okay, so let's see here. Where are we? We already talked about some of this stuff. I want to start getting into our, our case studies. Before we go on break, let's talk for a minute about regulated versus deregulated grids. So in a regulated grid, that's kind of like the, the Tennessee Valley Authority region or the Mississippi Power uh, region where you don't have any choice where you buy your electricity from. It's one supplier for the whole area, and it's very simple. You know, I, I just moved across town, and my power company is the same. I just call them up. They, they switch me over to the new account, you know, and, and that's it. It's not this long protracted process of canceling your existing, you know, customer and, and signing up for a new provider. You know, regulated grids are monopolies, but they're also simple. And so the idea is that we've given these uh, entities a monopoly on the electric grid in exchange for low-priced electricity, a streamlined process, increased consumer protection. And the check and balance is the public utility commission. So if the, if the power company wants to increase their rates, they have to run it through a, 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 a public entity. Now, you also can have deregulated grids. And the idea is that Customers get ticked off at their power company, say, uh, you know, like in Mississippi right now. You know, the Mississippi Power built this way overpriced clean coal power plant called the Kimber Coal Plant, and it's projected to increase the cost of electricity by 20% in the area. 
And so the customers get ticked off and they say, you've made bad decisions. You have not uh, provided us with good consumer oriented policies. We want competition in the market. So we're going to deregulate you. And the idea is that deregulation drives more competition and competition keeps pricing low. But at the end of the day, it is all about generating electricity at point A and delivering it to point B. And what we have here on a deregulated grid, and this is a, a fully deregulated grid. This is in Texas. And so in Texas, whoever sells you electricity legally cannot own the generating assets. And then whoever maintains the distribution lines, they still have a monopoly, but the monopoly has shrunk from everything to just a monopoly over distribution or just a monopoly over transmission. And then you have independent power generators and then independent retailers, and they have to navigate this whole process to get from point A to point B by the time you get to your customer. And what's kind of ironic is as soon as you get into a deregulated grid, the customers start to group up again so that they can get better pricing discounts through bulk purchasing. So as soon as they say, you know, we want to pick all of our providers, they say, well, I'm going to buddy up with my neighbor and we're just going to have one provider for the two of us. You know, so it is a, a, a subject of debate on whether or not a regulated grid or a deregulated grid really saves the customer money. You know, on a, on a regulated grid, you have less customer choice, but you have more opportunity for a streamlined process. On a deregulated grid, there is the potential that all of this additional red tape and hands in the cookie jar drives the price of electricity up. On the other hand, there is an element of competition. And so it's, it's um, I don't know if, if the, the matter is decided on whether or not a regulated or deregulated grid is better for the uh, customer. But what I do know is that on a, on a regulated grid, the solar programs are essentially whatever the utility says it is. So in Tennessee, Instead of doing net metering, they do this program where you actually do not connect the, the solar array to your electric service. You just feed it directly into the grid on its own account. And that's the only program. In fact, uh, I'm starting to get customers who say, well, what they're buying back the electricity for is still below the retail price of electricity. So I would rather connect the solar array to my electric service and use it for backup power during a power outage. And because uh, the TVA has not developed a program for load side connections, it's very difficult to do a roadside connection because the, the electric cooperatives don't have any paperwork for doing any kind of connection other than the utility specific program. And so there are opportunities for solar development on regulated grids where the TVA for utility scale development, they have an open renewable standard offer that says, look, if you can make solar work at four cents a kilowatt hour, we'll buy all the solar you want. So build a 100 megawatt solar power plant, that's great. But at the same time, it doesn't necessarily, you have to play by their rules. On a deregulated market, if you want to go and build a, a you know, five megawatt solar farm on your farmland, there is a procedure in place for you to go and register as a power generator and if you can go and find a customer at the end of the line here, you know, all you have to do is figure out the transmission and distribution costs, but no one's going to get in your way and say, no, you can't do that. And so even on a deregulated grid, issues like buyback rates and net metering and stuff like that, they become um, a, a lot more complicated because the retail electric provider can say, now, wait a minute. 
you know, I, I, I'm just here to sell electricity to the customer. I'm not here to buy back electricity from the customer. So someone else is going to have to buy it back. And the distribution company says, well, that's not my job. I'm just here to maintain the lines. And the transmission company says, well, <laughs> it should be more the distribution company. So if it's not them, it's certainly not us. And then the power generation company says, well, it's not our job to buy back electricity either. We're here to generate power and sell it. And so there's a, a federal law called PURPA that says customers are entitled to at least the avoided costs of fuel for their backfed 100% clean electricity. But on a deregulated market, it becomes very complicated to determine, well, who is in charge of of compensating the customer for backfed electricity to be compliant with PURPA. And what happens is that you have retail electric providers who say, well, we'll give you some buyback rate so that you'll be our customer. Because most solar customers do not generate 100% of their electric bill, they generate something less than that. Now, uh, the one, one issue with a deregulated market is that you really need to be an expert. You know, on the TVA region, they might have a very rigid structure for purchasing, for developing utility scale solar, but at least it's very clearly defined and it's a 20 year contract and you know exactly how much you're getting. And so you can develop a cash flow model and secure your financing. And, and by the time the project comes out of the ground, you, you, the investors know what they're gonna get. You know, on a deregulated grid, you know, you say, well, how, how, is, it, how is the grid even being balanced under this? And it's a, a, a basket of long-term contracts, day-ahead contracts, and then if there's a severe weather event and your electric use spikes through the rooftop and all of a sudden the, um, you know, the, the retail electric providers who have, have made all of their agreements with the power generation companies subject to transmission and distribution fees, if these retail electric providers did not buy enough electricity for that day to deliver to their market, well, there's a, a day ahead market. So you can look at the weather and say, oh, we're going to need more electricity. So let's buy some more electricity. And then if they still come up short, there's a settlement process where you have peaker plants dumping in super expensive electricity into the grid to maintain stability. And then that's, there's a, a settlement process so that if you're a retail electric provider and you didn't buy enough, you get penalized by the cost of that real-time market. And so it balances itself out. But, you know, that's, that's uh, you know, that's a lot more hands in the cookie jar. So whether or not that level of competition, you know, actually lowers price or increases the red tape to the point where the competition is new, you know, that's uh, a good graduate thesis, I'd say. But what I want to bring up is that in Texas, which has a deregulated grid, you can go and find a retail electric provider, and not only do they have plans that are flexible, that might be more solar friendly, you know, here's a, a retail electric provider that does offer a solar buyback plan. And even though Texas does not have a net metering law, and because it's so deregulated, a net metering law would actually be kind of complicated to, to implement and have it hold up in court. You know, you'd have to have a really strong public utility commission to say, no, the voters want this law, and so you have to figure out how to comply with it. You know, you may or may not have that strong of a public utility commission, but in Texas, even so, you can find a, volunteer, a retail electric provider who is voluntarily offering a solar buyback plan, and maybe it's not retail price, but it might be 50% of retail price or 60% of retail price, whereas in Mississippi, 
even though we're on a regulated utility where there's no competition. And so because there's no competition, that, that cooperative, the TVA or Mississippi Power, they've been given a monopoly, but the consumers actually have fewer solar options than they would on a deregulated grid. If I want to do a load side interconnection of a solar array in most of the Tennessee Valley Authority region, there is no process for that. And when I call up the cooperatives, they say, we don't have an interconnection agreement. You just need to pull an electrical permit. And so I say, well, do you mean there's dozens of solar arrays all across Tennessee that have no interconnection agreements and do not get any kind of PURPA compensation? And, and, and in many areas, there's because it's rural, there's no permit office. So you might have unpermitted solar being backfed onto the grid without any kind of interconnection application. And the, the cooperatives say, yep, that's true. And then I call up the TVA and the TVA says, no, those cooperatives need to have all this stuff in place, but they just don't. And they don't do anything about it and you just sit dead in the water. And so it's, it's for these regulated markets, you know, they have to keep a, a very close eye on what the, the free market is providing solar customers because if regu because just by, by their nature, they get that monopoly in exchange for consumer protection. And they could be exposing themselves to legal liability if there are deregulated markets that provide better consumer protection than the regulated markets, then that is a strong argument for deregulation. Now, what that means is that utilities can't ignore renewables like some have in the past, they need to develop renewable programs and policies, but they are in a tough spot where the more distributed renewables that come onto the grid, the less their revenue base shrinks. So what options do they have? And that's where community solar comes in and solves a lot of problems because it can enable the utility to do solar in a profitable manner by selling community solar to the same customers that used to buy voluntary green power. So what we're gonna do right now is it's, it's uh, 1240. We're gonna take a 15 minute break. When we come back from the break, we're gonna look through a few case studies for community solar uh, and, and see how different utilities in different parts of the country have adopted their programs to meet their specific state rules and regulations. And then we'll, we'll conclude with a little bit of a discussion on how you might go about developing your own community solar program or even why you might go about doing that as well. So uh, let's take a 10 minute break. It's uh, you know, a 15 minute break. It's uh, 1243 Central Time right now. Uh, we'll pick back up at, you know, about five till.
All right, we're going to give people another minute or two to come back to their desk. So we'll get started in about a, a minute or so. So uh, we're going to go explore some uh, community solar projects all around the country. First one's kind of a, a lighthearted dig at Alabama because I'm in Mississippi. But uh, Alabama went to go and develop their very first community solar project in their state. You know, this is a, a regulated grid with no net metering policy. And... Uh, and, and very limited buyback ability for you to just, you know, in, in Mississippi Power's grid, you, you participate in the buyback program and they buy back your electricity about, at about four and a half, five cents and retail values around 11. Um, so it's not, I'd say it's not a very consumer friendly solar policy in, in Alabama, no state net metering law, nothing like that. But they went to go and develop their very first community solar project and it, it didn't make it out of the ethics committee vote because it turned out that the landowner was the public utility commissioner. So he didn't see why that would be a conflict of interest given that he's the one who gives a thumbs up or thumbs down on state net metering laws and he was getting a quarter million dollar of land lease payments out of the proposed project so that one uh you know let's go and go and explore some more real projects now this one's kind of interesting this is in the the tva region and um at the time the tva had a, a program where you could do megawatt sized projects at about eight cents a kilowatt hour. And so one of the uh, cooperatives said, well, we want to participate in that program. And so they filled out an application, got approval for a, a one megawatt solar array at an eight cent power purchase agreement. And so they, what they did is they got a, a project underwriter that said, hey, I'll do this project at eight cents. That makes sense for me. And so they actually built the, pro, the project before they even knew what their community solar business model would be. You know, they said, well, this is just something we want to do. And so that's kind of um, an interesting takeaway is that you can actually convert existing solar arrays into community solar opportunities. Uh, this, this example I want to bring up next is not in the slide, so I'll put the link into the, the chat box. So here's a company called Arcadia Power that does exactly that. They take existing solar arrays and they turn them into community solar projects. And so they, they, they give a, a feeling of the same kind of, um, well, I guess they don't have, you know, they, they have a little bit of a, a display that's the same kind of display as a, a solar array owner would get. So they provide the feeling of solar array ownership. And I guess they, they changed up their, their web design because they used to have, uh, 
they used to have the actual projects you could invest in listed on their website. I guess they've taken some information out. But no, I'm going to have to stop referencing them if they don't have information available anymore. But basically what this company has done is they've taken solar projects in areas along the northeast coast where the price of electricity is high, but they're doing rooftop commercial projects and turning them into community solar. And what the, the, the contractual arrangement is with Arcadia Power, or at least what it was a few months ago, was that you would buy into the community solar project for seven years. And effectively, you would get your money back at the end of the seven-year mark. And so you were basically providing, you know, either at the $100 level or $200 level or $300 level, you were providing a seven-year 0% interest loan to the commercial solar project. And in exchange for that, what Arcadia Solar would do is they would take your existing electrical account and take your login information and they say, okay, well, now instead of getting an electric bill from your power company, we're going to pay your electric bill and we're going to credit you onto that what your one panel or two panels or three panels would, would generate. And uh, we're going to give you a little online monitoring portal, just like those other solar owners who actually own their arrays get. And so you only have one electric bill. You know, they kind of put their bill on top of your solar, your regular electric bill. And they pay your bill. They credit you your compensation rate over the seven years. But it's really not anything that you are getting your, your money back on. So it's not a, a, a great deal for, the, for the, the investor. At the same time, you're supporting solar power. You're providing the capital needed to get the projects out of the ground. Uh, but the projects, because they've already been built, you know, it's a, a fairly risk-free environment. And so what does that mean when you're there, you issue a, a seven-year capital equipment loan at 0% to a commercial project is maybe that project doesn't have to come up with, or maybe that project still needs to come up with the construction financing. But after the construction financing, then you have, you know, the, the operational financing and you're providing them with a, a, a very low interest loan so that you know the, the cost savings of the array can start to pay off that loan payment. And so you're making the financing for solar cheaper for somebody else and gaining the, the feeling of solar ownership, um, although it's really not that great of a financial deal. You know, it, it does help. It does help the project developer get the solar project secured, you know, and, and you are helping local solar come to the grid. And well, that's kind of interesting too, because what that means is you're, you're reducing the risk for the developer by involving community members who are willing to, you know, maybe not provide a $500,000 loan at 0% interest for seven years. But instead, you're getting a bunch of people to provide $200, $300, $400 loans at 0% interest for seven years. And so you might ask, well, if I'm, if I'm taking money from someone like Arcadia Power is, I take, if I'm Arcadia Power, I'm taking their $400 or $500 or $600, and then I'm promising them that they're going to get a series of payments over five, six, seven years. How is that not 
like a security investment or buying a stock with a dividend or purchasing an annuity? How is that not a financial vehicle that would be regulated by the Security Exchange Commission? And what's kind of funny is that the, the guidance so far um, from the SEC is they've said we're not going to treat community solar products like other kinds of investment vehicles because by and large they are not good investment vehicles for their participants that the participants are often um, losing a little bit of money rather than gaining a little bit of money and and so for the time being unless you were to develop a profitable community solar model um, you don't have to worry so much about the, the SEC coming in and, and regulating your community solar project as a financial instrument. Now, that might all change if you are actually developing a profitable community solar model. And obviously, that's, you know, <laughs> what we want to do. We don't want to just rely on altruists to uh, clean our electric grid. <clears throat> And we don't want to do it in a not profitable manner either. But the, the, you know, the, what I wanted to really emphasize with this example, you know, the other case studies are going to get more detailed, but it is possible to take an existing solar array and convert it into a community solar project. And basically, when you do that, you're cashing out the investor at the beginning of the project and transferring the risk to a class of residential customers who are satisfied with a much lower return on their investment, even a negative return on their investment, extended out over a long period of time. And so it begs the question, why wouldn't you have any solar project be a community solar project um, from an investor perspective it, it secures you it, it reduces the need for that investor who's underwriting the project to be a long-term investor you know if, if the project gets a, a seven percent return on investment for 20 years you know maybe they can take all of that profit in the first two or three years by transferring the 20 year term to a community solar member who might be more happy with a 4% return on investment each year, thereby providing more profitability to the developer and reducing their risk. So let's go in and drill down into Minnesota's community solar projects because they're, they've, they've really kind of got out in front uh, in New York as well with community solar policies and we'll talk about like how these projects are, are being played out in the field. So here's a headline. It says, Geronimo sells a 66 megawatt community solar portfolio to Berkshire Hathaway Renewables. And, uh, you know, what it says is includes 66 megawatts of solar garden projects across 21 locations and 16 counties. So 66 megawatts over 21 locations, you know, that's an average project size of about 3 megawatts each. So why do the community solar projects look like this in, in Minnesota? Well... I asked them. <laughs> I went to their website and I said, well, tell me a little bit more about your, your uh, community solar program. And you go to the, the Geronimo website and it says you get annual energy savings. So you get annual savings, no upfront investment. Enjoy the security backing of Berkshire Hathaway. Support renewables, increase brand loyalty. Keep your dollars local, no maintenance or overhead because, you know, you don't have the solar array on your rooftop. It's out in the field and there's a company providing the maintenance. And then, again, they emphasize, enjoy the security of Berkshire Hathaway. 
So let's just uh, think about that for a minute. And, you know, let's say, you know, they are saying that there's some annual energy savings, but they're also emphasizing some like non-monetary benefits like brand loyalty. So, you know, Whole Foods might buy into the community solar project to say, we support local solar power. And they're emphasizing the localness as well. And the no maintenance is nice. So I asked them, you know, what was lacking was the actual dollars and cents. You know, they're saying energy savings, but what does that actually mean? How profitable is the program for the participant? So I pulled them up and I, I asked them and I got transferred to their director of marketing. And his response was, he wasn't going to answer my questions because that information is commercially sensitive and not available. I mean, that, that kind of rubs me the wrong way because, after all, there is a 30% federal tax credit on these projects. It's not purely a, a private commercial enterprise. They are taking the government dole on this, so I would like there to be a little bit more public transparency on 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 this. And, and to some extent, the tax credit complicates things because people, you know, who are the underwriters of these large projects? Well, they're investment funds, hedge funds, you know, multi-million dollar portfolios that can use the tax credit Whereas not all residential customers can have the tax credit. So right now with the import tariff and the tax credit, we're making solar more expensive and then giving that money back through returns on our taxes. But at the same time, that means that only people, you know, who can benefit from the tax credits can really do solar in a profitable manner. It's not optimal, but it is what it is. Well, I didn't think that that answer was very good, but right after I got that email from the director of marketing, their VP of business development sent me an email, and, and he wanted to explain why they couldn't provide me with any program details. And they said that it's uh, the, the customer's uh, contracts are a function of individual negotiations bound by confidentiality confidentiality to protect customer privacy. Um, do I really think that they're developing a different contract for every single community solar participant? No. You know, so I hope that you can understand our restrictions for sharing the customer's cost expectations in a public forum. Can't really understand that. They said, if I were an actual customer, then they would be happy uh, to, to share information with me, but since I'm in Mississippi and not in Minnesota, they're not going to tell me anything. Well, okay, let's put this aside for a minute. What we want to do is go into the desired database and look up Minnesota's state policies. And if we go online into the desired database, we get into this value of solar tariff. We're going to look at that in a little bit. Let's, here's another community solar program that's not the Berkshire Hathaway Geronimo portfolio, but it's also in Minnesota. So this is the same policies, different program, with a little bit more information available publicly. Here's a customer, and, in, and he's paying SunShare 13 cents per kilowatt hour generated by the subscription with the rate increasing it says slightly but who knows what it actually is you know it says the rate increases slightly each year over a, a 25 year contract so this is not someone who is saving money from community solar he's actually paying 13 cents a kilowatt hour increasing slightly each year for 25 years. So he's not buying in, there's no upfront investment. What he's saying is I'm gonna get an electricity rate for 13 cents for 25 years. And then that payment gets subtracted from his electric bill. So it's like he pays, you know, $50 a month 
to the community solar program, and then he gets $50 a month taken off of his electric bill. Now, in this article, it says SunShare projects solar power will be cheaper than power from the grid. And so over the life of the contract, Burr is going to save between $5 and $50 a month. And then um, the, the, the rest of the article, you know, it says the customer thought he was getting a good deal, but his, his major complaint. See, I don't know how I can make that go away. But anyway, what it says, what it says at the bottom here is, is the his main complaint was that he signed up for the program and he discovered that the solar array was not yet built. And so, you know, there may be an advantage if you can build the solar project and then convert it into community solar later. You know, you may have a higher degree of customer satisfaction. We're going to come back to, to Mr. Burr and that, that 13 cent rate over 25 years that increases each year in just a minute. Still on, on the Berkshire Hathaway component, you know, I felt like, well, if, if Berkshire Hathaway or Geronimo, their developer partner, they're not going to tell me what their program details are. I'll just go find one of their customers and, and test if they're really bound by confidentiality agreements or not by finding out what the contract terms and conditions are from the customer. So I got online to a, a, a chat form and found a customer who was in Berkshire Hathaway's program. And this is what he said. He said, um, you know, Berkshire Hathaway's production facilities is, um, you know, at the, he says, just signed up ourselves. It's actually slightly cheaper than retail if you were paying for wind source. And so this is a customer who was already a voluntary green power customer. And he said, rather than do the green power premium, I'm gonna go do the community solar product. And so we're seeing, you know, who are the participants in community solar? They're environmental altruists who are already buying green power, but they see the community solar product as a better product than the older rec product that is mainly sourced from wind farms, which we know is a very murky industry because while not all utilities are doing this across the board, looking at the average cost versus the average price, we know that most of that money is staying with the utility and not actually going into the wind farm. So he says, I don't want to do that. I want to do community solar. So he says, after the agreement is over, you have to renew somewhere else. And that is one real advantage that if you buy solar, you get the salvage value from it. If you do community solar, you don't own the asset at the end of the agreement. That's all she wrote. And so there's no additional return that you may or may not make. Um, you can terminate the agreement without penalty if you move or if you lose your home or if you die. Um, but otherwise, there's, you know, if you terminate without cause, there's a termination fee. Okay, so you, you know, if you sign up for the program and you realize that it's a terrible deal, you're stuck for 25 years unless you move, go bankrupt, or die. But other than that, it's, you know, compared to, say, a, a solar lease, on a solar lease, if you move, you don't get out of your lease. You know, you have to, to transfer that lease to the new home buyer, and they may not want to take that lease. Um, you know, and, and for that matter, solar leasing is a little dangerous because it's, it's a longer term than say like a car lease. And whereas you can get uh, any tow truck driver, if your, your customer defaults on their car lease, you can haul the car off. It's a lot harder to haul a solar array off that's bolted to a rooftop than it is a vehicle and your, your term is for 25 years instead of seven. 
you know, so there, there might be a, a little bit of a bubble in, in solar leasing. It says, um, you know, the, the, the termination fee is flexible and it depends on the cost of energy. So they're really not trying to rip you off of that termination fee, but they recognize that, you know, there is a cost to early terminate and you are making a 25 year commitment. All that's very reasonable. And then he says, hey, you know, this only makes sense if the rate of regular energy increases faster than the rate of the solar garden. I may save $10,000 over 25 years, or I may end up paying a little bit extra. Well, that's a really big extreme. I, I might save $10,000 or lose five or six or seven hundred dollars, thousand dollars, I don't know. But, you know, he says it is a little bit of a gamble. All right. So I asked them, well, how much do you know about your agreement? Do you know what renewable energy credits are? Do you get to keep the renewable energy credits? And he says, well, you actually don't own the panels. So you're simply agreeing to buy energy from the company. So, you know, really all, all he's doing is saying, I agree to buy the electricity from the solar farm for 25 years at 13 cents plus a, a rate increase each year. And maybe that's going to cost me money or maybe not. But for him, you know, compared to the regular rate plus the green premium, it's something that is, you know, the, 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 it, it's worth it to him. So I say, well, you know, if you're if you're not keeping the wrecks, are they is there double counting going on? Are they telling you you're buying solar power? Uh, do they tell you that you're actually not buying solar power because in this program the investor keeps the wrecks? And he says, yeah, you know, they say that you're purchasing photovoltaic production capacity. And so I guess, I guess saying that you're purchasing photovoltaic production capacity is not exactly the same as saying you're purchasing solar power, but you do see a little bit of wordsmithing going in to, to kind of have your cake and eat it too. And, and what it says here is that the recs are actually going to Northern States Power Company, Minnesota Corporation, and so the RECs are not going to the community solar participants. Someone, they're going to um, a utility who's being used, uh, who's using those RECs to count towards a, a state mandate. And that would be different than the wind choice program where you're actually getting the RAC and then it's not going towards the state mandate. So that begs the question, <clears throat> you know, the state is mandated to purchase green energy and by you helping develop this project by voluntarily increasing your electric bill do you realize that the utility if you didn't pay for this project the utility would still have to pay for the project one way or another so in in other words you are paying this the utilities tab for their environmental remediation efforts. So, you know, if those environmental remediation tab, that tab would have to be paid either way, if you paid it or they paid it. So in other words, you know, by you paying the cost of the company to do environmental remediation, you're almost letting them off the hook from their responsibilities. And he says, well, I didn't realize they would be forced to buy it, but, you know, you're being too harsh, JR. You know, you you need to stop being a, a pencil pusher or a bean counter. You know, if the state wants to support renewable energy this way, and uh, you know, I that's something I want to help them do. You know, so stop being so polarizing and, and I just want to work together and, and help this project come out of the ground. Okay, fair enough. You know, how much of the rate stabilization is an incentive for your participation? You know, that, that 13 cent rate with a little bit of an adder is locked in over 25 years. So often you'll say, well, you get to control your electric rate and know what it is. He says, well, I didn't really care about that. 
And even if my costs are a little bit higher, you know, really what I want to do is, is provide industry growth, bring solar prices down, and allow me to feel like I'm installing solar even though my home's not, you know, ideal for it. So this is where, you know, I might say, hey, there's all these things that aren't really accounted for. And he says, you're missing the, the forest for the trees. You know, what I want to do is, is support solar power in Minnesota, and, and that's why I'm doing this. Well, that's actually very interesting. That means that the participant is not really economically motivated. They're motivated by other reasons uh, beyond the economics. And to the point where even the, the hedge is not the primary reason. So I say, well, so what? Your contract is something like 14 cents for 20 years. And he says, yes. You know, that's similar to that other uh, sun source. So what's going on here? Why is, why, what is causing these projects to be developed? Well, let's go on to the Desire website and take a look at a couple of their programs. You know, one is the value of solar tariff which up to one megawatt projects, it entitles you to a compensation rate and the utility gets to keep the recs. And so this is, if I'm a, a solar owner and I develop a one megawatt solar farm, there is a, a value of solar tariff that I'm entitled to get in Minnesota and the utility gets to keep the recs in exchange for that. Um, Okay, so what this is, is uh, under the, the Minnesota value of solar tariff, um, utilities must compensate at the value of solar tariff rate if it's approved by the utility. However, Excel can use retail rates instead of value of solar tariff as long as there is an adder in addition to the retail rate for the solar renewable energy credit. So that's a little confusing, but just bear with me for a minute. You know, what these projects are doing is they're, they're we see from the SunShare program, we see from the Geronimo Energy program that these projects are charging customers about 14 cents a kilowatt hour for 20 to 25 years, or maybe it's 13 cents with an adder each year. Um, What's the price of energy in Minnesota? Well, we look up their, their rate schedule, and the electric bill is around $0.09, cents, and then the distribution fee brings it up to about $0.11 to $0.12. Cents. So the cost of electricity in Minnesota is about $0.12 cents a kilowatt hour, and all of these programs are at $0.13 cents plus a rider or $0.14 cents flat. You know, what, it's, what they're doing is getting participants to agree to increase their electric bill by 16%. Now imagine if you're a utility and you go in front of the Public Utility Commission and you say, look, the market has changed. We need to increase our rates by 16% to maintain our business. You might have protests in the street by consumers being irate that their bills are going up by 16%. But instead, you have customers lining down the block who are voluntarily opting into this higher rate structure. So it's kind of a counterintuitive but what through this program they've convinced customers to increase their electric bills and furthermore if you increase your electric bill today by 16 percent even if the, the escalator is below the average inflationary cost you're still not going to um you know break even on the project over that 20-year term you're going to take about a five percent loss on your 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 project value and you're not even going to end up really saving money where the the payment where your rate is less than the retail price until well into the tail end of the project and so if you move out of state or you die or you um you know or you i don't know if 
you have to stay on that electric grid for 20 to 25 years in order to receive any value. Of course, the, customer, the utility is going to want you to, to leave the program because you're paying a higher rate over the first 10 to 12 years and then maybe a lower rate over the last 15 to 25 years. And so if you leave and move and have to cancel, they're going to say, fine, get out of here. We're, we're going to not, you know, that's great. It's a good deal for us for you to cancel. So go on your merry way. And so let's go ahead and, and pull open the, the desire database and, and take a look at Minnesota's program. So here's desireusa.org. I'm going to put it in the, the chat box if you want to look it up for your own state. It's a very handy website. Um, so here's Minnesota. I'm going to click on it. They have these, these handy filters, so let's uh, filter by solar technology, new photovoltaics, apply filters. And so now we get into to Minnesota's solar policies. And we got, uh, let's go ahead and look at their net metering law. Let's look at their you know, there's there's a lot of stuff in the desired database. It's always good to, to look at it. Let's look at this community-based energy development tariff, the seabed tariff. You know, here's their value of solar tariff. And that's all relevant to the community solar program. So first, let's start out with net metering. This is if you put solar on your own roof, what your compensation rate it is. And it says for projects up to one megawatt or community projects up to five megawatts. So remember in that Berkshire Hathaway portfolio, the average project size was three megawatts. And so this would apply to the Berkshire Hathaway portfolio of the community solar projects. It says for systems, it says customers own the RECs. You know, you might do some aggregate meters for net metering. And there's some ongoing issues being considered. You know, but basically what this says is Minnesota state net metering policy is to allow net metering up to uh, one megawatt on site. And they even have a community solar program where you can buy into these five megawatt projects and get a net metered rate up to five megawatts. Now, you know, the, the, the Berkshire Hathaway portfolio is different. You're not buying into the project, you're buying the energy from the project. So you're not paying, you know, a dollar per watt to buy into the project, you're just buying the kilowatt hours out of it. So you're not net metering, you're a purchaser. So then we get into the, uh, let's go ahead and look at their value of solar tariff. You know, this is, this is what governs the buyback rate of solar. And so it says uh, for commercial, industrial, residential, um, for systems up to one megawatt, there's a value of solar tariff. It says no utility in Minnesota has adopted value of solar in lieu of net metering. Because when, remember what we saw in the value of solar tariff is that if they opt into a value of solar tariff for the time being, it has to be retail plus additional value for the renewable energy credit. So it's, uh, you know, if, if you're a utility and you opted into this value of solar tariff, it says under approved retail rates plus the adder, the subscribers will receive 11 to 15 cents a kilowatt hour for the electricity produced by the garden. And so they, what they have is a feed-in rate that the utility must purchase the electricity at in, in order to get out of net metering. And the idea is that this rate is, is higher today, but it might be lower tomorrow. 
but it's not a very popular program. So finally, we get into this community-based energy development tariff for solar and other things. And it says, the seabed rate must be higher in the first 10 years of the agreement than in the last 10 years of the agreement. You know, this is to provide the renewable projects with better cash flow. It says 51% of the revenue from this power purchase agreement must go to Minnesota-based owners and other qualifying entities. And so what this says is if, if a company like Berkshire Hathaway wants to come in and build a renewable project, and look, here's another thing that says this is for projects of five megawatts or less. So this is why you know you have a portfolio of 66 megawatts, but it's divided up into these smaller project sites. And then look, they have half of the ownership has to go in state. And so they need to sign up local participants in order to qualify for this tariff. It can't just be an out-of-state company developing an in-state project and then taking all of the, the budget for it. Uh, it has to be supported by the county board, yada, yada. You know, what this is saying is that there is a rate that you are allowed by state law that can be higher than retail price that you can charge someone for. That if you build a solar project, you are able to charge someone above the retail price of electricity for the power that comes out of it. This is what this rate says. So for projects that are smaller than five megawatts, you can build it interconnected into the grid and have a rate that is above retail price of electricity. So if you're a utility and you want to increase your rates on your customers, build a community solar project and you're going to get rubber stamped through the approval process for that rate increase. Okay. So now what we're seeing is that what the Minnesota program is, is they've approved a rate structure that will increase the price of electricity for the participants, but they, are, they have a rubber stamp project to say, you build a solar project, we will allow you to charge this higher rate to the participants. And in addition to that, they allow the renewable energy credits to stay with the utility to be counted towards the state mandated goals. So the utility, not only are they able to charge a higher rate to their customers, they also get the renewable energy credits to uh, count towards their portfolios. And as long as they can fill up the program and find buyers for that electricity, everything's tied up in a book. And so what we see coming out of this, this Berkshire Hathaway Geronimo project or the Sunshare project or what have you is you have a pre-sales effort to get subscribers ahead of the project. And once you get your project subscribed, you have enough customers saying, increase my electric rate to put me onto that seabed tariff rate where I'm going to be paying 14 cents now, but maybe... 10 or 15 years from now, I'm still paying 14 or 15 cents and maybe the price of electricity has gone up by then. So I'm paying more now. I might save more later. They sign up all the customers willing to participate, plug the solar array into the grid, and all of a sudden they have a power purchase agreement in place for 14, 15 cents a kilowatt hour coming out of that solar array, and that's a high enough rate for it to be a very profitable project for the developer. And that developer may or may not be the utility itself, but at the very least, if the utility is doing nothing, they're getting the renewable energy credits for free. And, and beyond that, they might take a, a, a larger stake in the project and take on more profitability from that. And so, um, you know, it's, it's a very innovative rate structure, at least until solar is 2% of the state of Minnesota. So I don't know if they're going to get subscribers in the future under this 
rate structure, but for the time being, it's a way that they can grow their solar economy without increasing the price of electricity on the non-participant and help the utility meet their renewable goals. And so all this seabed tariff and value of solar tariff, you know, that's just a, a rubber stamp pro process so that they can charge a higher than retail rate to the customers uh, without, you know, having a, a battle with the Public Utility Commission. Everything, the, the framework is already there. And so you see a, a similar structure going on in New York where you get, get some pre-sales going. And so instead of buying into the solar array, the sales process is, is buy the electricity from the solar array. And then the developer like Berkshire Hathaway is the underwriter. Um, and maybe there's an agreement in place with the utility to get the utility on board to market and support the project. And usually these are in states that have net metering laws already in place. And so in Minnesota, if it's a choice between giving a solar customer net metering and losing that revenue versus rolling up your sleeves, developing a community solar project and increasing the price of electricity in your area in a way that's non-controversial, you know, that's enough of a carrot to get the utility to to, um, you know, encourage that development. So in, in New York, the uh, you're credited at retail rate. Um, any surplus is reconciled annually. The ownership of the RECs is not addressed. And they do allow community net metering. So community net metering is kind of an interesting concept. Um, this is where the, the solar array, let's see if I can get that box to do it. It's right down here. Um, this is where the solar array is located off site, but you're still getting a retail credit on your bill. And so that actually is very interesting. What if you could build a larger one megawatt, five megawatt project instead of a 10 kilowatt project on your roof? But get the same compensation rate for it. That sounds like a, a great deal for the customer. And so in, in, and in New York, that's allowed. You can have a, a community solar project that has a minimum of 10 members with a site host. You know, the site host has certain requirements in terms of uh, um, they, can, they can only, you know, the, the site hosts a single individual um, cannot own more than 40% of the project. And so they, they, get, they get multiple people involved for a retail credit on the bill. Um, now, if you are face, if you are a utility and you are facing a, a net metering law, you may want to try and develop a contract where the participant gets less than net metering. You know, if you get if you're required to give them eleven cents unless they voluntarily opt into nine cents. You know, you would want to try and get them to voluntarily opt into nine cents. So rather than have all these New Yorkers go and participate in the community solar net metering infrastructure, you may instead want to develop as a utility your own community solar program to offer the customers so that they don't develop their own projects, but instead use your infrastructure at a lower compensatory rate because it's easier and more streamlined because the utilities involved. So in some ways, these net metering laws are helping encourage utilities to, to develop these public-private partnerships with developers and participants um, who might be going solar on their rooftop, but if you can give them ownership in an offsite solar array that they don't have to maintain, they might take a lower rate and that might stem the revenue loss 
versus what you would get with rooftop solar, which would be pure revenue loss. And so here in New York, there's a, a company called Roofless Solar. And I called them up and talked to them. They're pretty forthcoming with their information. You know, they say that the payback ranges between five to 15 years. And that's mainly because, A, New York heavily subsidizes the solar industry. So it's, it's, it's very possible to get a four-year payback on a solar array, particularly if you're closer to New York City, where the price of electricity is sky high. If you go on to the other side of the state in Buffalo, New York, you still get the same subsidies, but the price of electricity is substantially less. And so that's where that five to 15 year payback varies so greatly. And the same company does, so in, in New York, they have community solar where you actually buy into the array and get a credit on your bill, which may be less than a net metered credit, but the utility is, is applying that credit directly on your bill and agreeing to play ball because the other option would cost them more money. And then there's a, a case in Massachusetts, a community solar program, where all you have to do is pick up the phone, call the com community solar company and say, hey, put me onto the community solar program and you will immediately knock off five to 10% from your bill. Why wouldn't you do that? It's effortless. Pick up the phone, get five to 10% off of your bill, and, and you do community solar. So how does that work? Well, in a sense, the Massachusetts program is the same as the Minnesota program, which is in order for the developer to get a, a special compensatory rate, they have to sign up subscribers who are willing to offtake the electricity. So in this case, in Massachusetts, rather than increasing their bill, they're decreasing it. But that is because the renewable energy credits in Massachusetts are so valuable. So here we're back on SREC trade, and we look at um, the value of renewable energy credits in Massachusetts. And in Massachusetts, the retail price of electricity is around 20 cents a kilowatt hour, and the renewable energy credits are worth 45 cents a kilowatt hour. And so in, in Massachusetts, in order to develop this solar project, if they can go in and say, we're fully subscribed, Public Utility Commission, please approve the project, they approve the project, they give the, uh, the customer a 5 to 10% discount on their electric bill, so they're paying 20 cents, and, uh, and effectively, they might be, by, by signing up, they might be saving, um, I guess that's 3 cents a kilowatt hour, but the developer is getting the renewable energy credits at 45 cents. And so if I'm an energy supplier, and it's a, a, a difference between um, gaining 45 cents, I'll happily give up 3 cents to gain 45 cents and get my solar project greenlit through the approval project by getting all these community members on board. But I, then again, the problem is, you know, it's so much more lucrative for the individual homeowner to install the solar array and get the the rec compensation themselves but not everybody is going to do that and so we have a couple of different flavors so far community solar in the in the, the minnesota model you have developers building the projects securing the 14 cent uh purchase rate and then um and, and, and then the customers are buying the energy coming out of it. You know, in New York, um, with the, the roofless solar model, it's different. You're paying for the array up front, and you get a net metered rate from that. And we're going to talk about this in a minute on why a utility might want to do that. But effectively, it's, it's under that net metered rate, the utility is going to lose the revenue no matter what. 
And so if the New Yorker puts a solar array on their home at $4 a watt, because rooftop solar costs more than utility scale solar per watt, they install the array for $4 a watt and they give the net meter the credit. Well, instead, the utility can go and build a five megawatt array at a dollar a watt. And since the New Yorker either way gets the net metered credit, they get the same rate whether or not they buy in the utility scale project or the rooftop project, the, the roofless solar company can go in and with the utility sell ownership in the utility array at the same price as residential solar. And that utility scale array has half the cost due to economies of scale. In other words, the utility is going to lose the revenue due to the net metering law, whether or not it's through this program or whether or not the array is up on the rooftop. The difference is if the array goes on the rooftop, that $4 a watt installation price is going to the installer. Whereas if the utility can develop a utility scale project at a dollar a watt and still charge $4 a watt, they're getting all the profit margin and even a larger profit margin off the project than what the residential solar contractor has. And so the, the attitude would be from the utility perspective is, well, if I'm going to lose revenue to net metering either way, I might as well get out there and start directly competing with the residential solar installer because I can sell ownership into the arrays at the same price as the residential installer. To the customer, it's the same, except they don't have to do maintenance because they're getting the same net metered rate either way. And the utility now, you know, they're losing revenue from the energy, but they're gaining profit off the install. And so the utility becomes the solar installer. The utility competes with the profit for the solar installer and uses their unique position to do larger projects and achieve economies of scale to actually outcompete the residential installer. And so the, the framework with community net metering in, in New York in the one sense, the utility could look at that and say, well, this is just going to spur more development in solar and my revenue loss is going to continue to leak. On the other hand, because community net metering is in fact allowed, it allows offsite development and with the right negotiation between the developer and the utility, the utility stands to gain profit that they would otherwise not get. And it can be substantial profit due to economies of scale if they can deliver, um, you know, utility scale projects and then get customers to pay residential pricing for it. Whether it's only short term gains is another issue, but that's still better than the do nothing scenario. And then in Massachusetts, the, the programs are literally too good to be true because you immediately start saving money, but that is purely because they're subsidizing their solar industry so much through their SREC sales. So finally, we get to what I would call the Michigan model, which is a hybrid approach that says, we're going to let our customers either pay up front for the array or buy the energy from the array at a premium or do something halfway in between. Now, this model is very similar to uh, a security or an annuity. And so it's been kind of um, on ice until uh, the SEC provided better guidance on on no, it wouldn't treat these kinds of community solar projects like traditional investment vehicles. And so what happens in, in Michigan is according to their website, you're subscribing to 500 watt blocks of solar energy. And you're gonna get a credit on your bill for 25 years because of that block. And um, you have a couple of different options. So I need to get that box to go away again. 
Now, a couple of different options. You can pay a lump sum of $1,289 upfront, or you can pay $40 a year for three years, $40 a month for three years, $20 a month for seven years, or $10 a month for 25 years. Okay. If I have $1,289 over 500 watts, and then I back out the tax credit, that is equivalent to buying a solar array at $3.60 a watt. And the average cost of installed solar, while it really needs to be lower than this, you know, I, I commonly see, um, pro and it can be lower than this. We talked about that in other classes, but I commonly see installs for three to four dollars a watt. And so basically in Michigan, they're selling a buy-in to a community solar project at residential pricing and then providing a retail credit. So we kind of saw that in the roofless solar model, residential pricing, retail credit, but the, because they're doing a megawatt project instead of a residential five kilowatt project, you know, the, the project at 360 a watt is much more profitable to the utility on that megawatt project than the residential installer on the five kilowatt project. In other words, now the Michigan utility is competing with residential installers and also making more profit off of it. And from their perspective, that customer who buys at 360 a watt under a net metered contract, they're going to lose the revenue either way. So they might as well, you know, put the residential installer out of business and make their profit and then some in the meantime. Alternately, if you went for the, not the lump sum payment, but you increase your electric bill by $10 a month for uh, 25 years, well, a 500 watt panel is going to produce about 52 kilowatt hours a month. So $10 a month divided by 52 kilowatt hours turns out to be about 19 cents a kilowatt hour. In Michigan, the price of electricity is 15 cents. And so if you go for the $10 a month, they're basically getting their customers to increase their electric rates by 28%. And try going in front of a public utility commission and asking for a 28% rate increase, but in fact, they're getting customers to voluntarily opt into it. It's not as bad as it sounds because in the Michigan model for that, that four cent premium increase, the customer actually gets the renewable energy credit. And then the utility on top of that turns around and says, we'll help you sell your renewable energy credits if you want us to. And so it might not actually be a four cent premium if they can sell their recs. It might only be a, a two cent premium, which would bring it in line with like that Minnesota model. So the Michigan model is great because it offers an upfront option where the, the owner can actually get a payback or an option where they increase their bill by the same as a voluntary green power purchase. And they have an option for buying the RECs at a higher premium or potentially selling the RECs. Whereas in, say, uh, New York or Minnesota, the customer doesn't get that option. They, they just don't get the RECs at all. And so then, then this uh, you know, another way is in Bark, Virginia. You know, they they simply just build a, a solar project and then get subscribers to buy the energy in five dollar blocks, and it, it effectively is an increase of two cents a kilowatt hour on their bill. And so what we see from this is that uh, a Community solar participants are more than willing to participate in community solar without a clear financial motive. You know, they're willing to increase their bills to support community solar. And that is why community solar is not considered an investment vehicle for these participants. And that might change if you were able to develop a profitable community solar model. But for the time being, 
you know, if, if you're doing community solar based on people increasing their bills, you don't have to worry so much about the investment implications of that. B, you see community solar providing renewable energy credits to utilities. Um, C, the more solar power that comes to the grid, you're increasing supply without increasing demand. I mean, there's, there are people who make arguments that solar power is increasing the cost of electricity. I have absolutely seen solar projects that, without a doubt, increase the price of electricity, mainly due to oversubsidization. You know, with the exception of New York or Massachusetts, you know, these community solar projects are not oversubsidized. You know, in fact, what they're what they're doing is 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 getting that solar to be added to the grid without the non-participant paying for it. You increase your supply without increasing the demand. Fundamentally, you know, this increase in solar power is actually keeping electricity pricing low rather than raising the bill. D, these solar projects, unlike other solar projects, actually give the opportunity for the utility to profit by effectively competing with the residential installer, but at a economic advantage, A, they already have the customer Rolodex, so there's no marketing involved. B, they already have the infrastructure, so they don't have to resort to blockchain and kind of quasi-legal compensatory agreements. Uh, they don't have to worry about SEC because they're already regulated by the Public Utility Commission, and they also get to take advantage of economies of scale, so the projects themselves are more profitable. So now we finally have uh, a framework for utilities to get in and compete with the installer. Um, and, and we also see that community solar participation is not the same as residential solar ownership. You know, we, I see a lot of politicians say community solar is great because it allows people without good rooftops for solar to participate. Well, sure, but that doesn't mean it's a financially good deal, whereas most people who own solar are motivated for economic reasons. B, uh, we really see it's not even that great for renters because that renter has to stay in the region for 15 years or more in order to receive any economic benefit. And so for renters or people without good solar rooftops, you know, yeah, they can get solar ownership, but a lot of these programs are regionally specific and you don't get your payback unless you can stay there for the long term. So is it really uh, a product for renters? You know, I don't know. I would say it might be a product for someone who wants to put solar on the roof, but, you know, doesn't, you know, would rather just increase their electric bill by $5 a month. Um... Another advantage is that the utilities can do this to say we do have options for uh, people who want to go solar, but they're on our own terms. And so they get to set the terms rather than um, just have their market space erode due to rooftop solar. Uh, and, then, and then also we see programs not the community solar programs do not meet the nationally accepted standards against double counting and so what i mean by that is when you participate in a minnesota community solar program when you participate in arcadia powers community solar program when you participate in new york or massachusetts pretty much any of these programs with the exception of michigan or the bark virginia which was similar to a portion of michigan's program in all those other case studies the renewable energy credits go to the utility and so you have customers being marketed as support the environment support community solar get cost savings, get environmental benefits, they get monitoring systems that tell them how much carbon they're, they're saving and stuff like that. 
They're, they're definitely telling their customers about certain kinds of environmental claims up to, you know, the edge of, a, of the law, and the customers don't understand that nuance. And so we're also seeing the erosion of these double counting, but at the same time, you know, maybe that, that partnership is, is un, you know, maybe I'm being too, um, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm missing the, the forest for the trees on this double counting because the participant is happy to support local solar. The utility needs to wet their beak a little bit at the bare minimum with free renewable energy credits, and it works. So, you know, it it's benefits the environment. You know, maybe I need to not be so much of a obstructionist. Okay, so you know, compared to solar leasing, compared to green power purchasing, community solar looks like a better deal. If you want to develop your own community solar program, you may want to verse yourselves in the differences between an operating lease and a capital lease because they have different tax implications. An operating lease is generally what solar is for. Um, and there are restrictions on operating leases. It can only be up to 80% of the life of the asset. Um, you know, at the, at the end of the term, the, the lessee does not get ownership of the asset. It goes back to the lease provider. Um, the lease provider is responsible for maintenance. You know, this is not just a solar thing. This is a general equipment thing. Whereas capital leasing is more like a loan. If you do a capital lease, the, the lessee generally will buy the asset at the end of the term for a dollar. Um, and they'll take the tax credits rather than the lease provider. And so whether you're structuring your, your, wind, your community solar program as an operating lease or a capital lease, maybe whether or not you want the tax credits to flow out of the project or remain with the developer. But if the projects are flowing out of the project, you also have to realize that you're actually giving up ownership of the project. So at the end of the year 20 or 25, you know, that person is going to own the array and not it return back to the developer. Uh, kind of moving along in the interest of time. You know, utility scale solar is cheaper than rooftop solar. And so uh, your solar modules may cost around 50 cents. That's still pretty much true with the import tariff at the utility scale level. Inverters are cheaper. Your racking cost for utility scale is not necessarily cheaper, but generally speaking on a utility scale project in even one megawatt, I'm calling utility scale for this discussion, you would do a tracking array, a single axis tracker, rather than a, um, a fixed array. So your racking budget is about the same, but you're getting 25% more power out of the array by using a, a single axis east-west tracker. Balance of system material, cost goes down, labor costs go down, all your site prep and equipment rental costs go way down. And so it's, it's you know, often your interconnection costs remain about the same. Um, your design fees go way down. And so, yeah, it is absolutely possible to develop, you know, one megawatt projects in the buck 50 a watt range. And so, you know, that's where, you know, if you did a residential solar, that cost may come out to $2 a watt and your more expensive areas, even a little bit more than that. So you talk about a $3 a watt or a $3.50 a watt sales price, you know, if you do a utility sale project at under a buck 50 and you sell it for over $3 a watt, that's a pretty healthy margin much larger margin than what you would see on a residential rooftop project. There are softwares out there for modeling uh, utility scale projects, rapid modeling, 
Um, even software is for doing demand profiling with storage. If you wanted to do a larger project on top of a commercial facility, software out there to help you do that and to generate project documentation. So um, uh, two years ago, the TVA announced a program for large scale development, but it had to be a community solar project. You know, that is no longer a $100,000 feasibility study. You know, to drop off an application, you know, it may just be that you need an array layout, a performance estimate, and a one-line diagram, and then a good, uh, and, and, and then simply a good lease agreement where, you know, your, your community solar program may be as simple as, um, you know, having a, a project underwriter and then transferring uh, blocks of the project to third parties through either operating leases or commercial leases, you know, or capital leases. It doesn't, it doesn't need to be anything more nuanced than that. In fact, um, if your project is located behind the meter, where you your your corporate business is already an off taker of the electricity, you may not even need to do any kind of formal uh, power purchase agreement with the utility if you can burn all of the energy on site. And so that opens up some some unique possibilities. You know, let's say you have a site that is a commercial demand structure site. So one, one site that leaps to mind is a, a convention center in town. So usually a convention center, they're on a big demand rate structure. And in our battery classes, we talk about how uh, one new thing in the solar industry is that the, um, is that batteries with very high demand charges are becoming the most cost-effective solar array. And so in that sense, you could, you know, you have the, the solar array producing power in the middle of the day, and then you have a, a battery coming in on partly cloudy days to help provide load leveling. And that, you know, in, in the past, these demand rate structures have not been good for solar, but now with solar plus batteries, you can shave off the building demand. And uh, that is incredibly valuable. And so what I'm thinking is, say, in Mississippi, you know, the retail price of electricity is, is nine cents a kilowatt hour, and you really have to install solar at two dollars or two fifty a watt for that to be in the financial interests of the customer. On the other hand, you could go and do an industrial solar battery and at you know three fifty a watt get a six or seven year payback. Uh, so the question becomes, well, where does the capital come from for that? And so the answer may be, well, what you do is you get a project underwriter for a, a solar peaker plant, which is a solar array plus a battery on an industrial facility with a, a high demand charge. And then you build the array with your project underwriter And so basically you can identify behind the meter opportunities for solar peaker batteries, get a project underwriter to build the array, and then over time offload the investment uh, to community solar members at a rate that is equivalent to you know, what they would get for putting solar on their own rooftop. And so you deliver, you know, say in Mississippi, you deliver a, a $3 watt array at nine cents, where installers are installing solar at 340 a watt at nine cents, and it's not a good deal. You give them a better deal on an array they don't even need to maintain, but because it's installed on an industrial site that is the lowest hanging fruit in the area, you know, basically what you're doing is, as long as you have your construction financing, you can cash out the investor at 
you know, within the first couple of years of ownership by offloading the long-term ownership onto community solar members at a lower return on their investment than what the original project underwriter put out. And so that's really where, where you see uh, a huge opportunity for community solar is to say that, look, you can develop a large project, convert it into community solar, offload it to people who want to go solar but don't have any other options, and then move on to the next project. You know, we, we talk to manufacturers who are on these industrial rate structures and the problem with manufacturers is they don't have the tax liabilities and so they can't really participate in the tax credits so all these individual homeowners do and so maybe you structure it as a as a capital lease instead of an operating lease and do true ownership of the array on that industrial uh, long-term facility all right, we're kind of near the end of our time, um, so I'm not going to get into the huge details on, on utility scale tracking, but the short of it is whenever you have land that you can drive a pile into, that is land that you're going to want to consider a tracking array on. So trackers at the utility scale are single access. They are all pile-driven systems. Um, and if you have the soil for that, then, then you want to consider a tracker. If you have granite soil, if you have rocky soil, may not be such a, a simple case. But, you know, single axis trackers will, uh, will produce more energy than what their uh, additional cost to the project will take off. And you can confirm that on PV watts. You can go in and, and uh, do that. Now, I'm going to take another about five minutes. So if you have to go, you're going to get the quiz emailed to you. So if you have to do a hard stop, don't worry about it. Go ahead and get out of here, and you'll get a, a quiz link in an hour. But I want to finish off the, the, the rest of this to say, well, what if you did want to take a convention center and put a community solar array on it? You know, one thing that you have to think, keep in mind is on these demand rate structures where most of the bill is the peak amplitude and the, the energy component is almost at cost. So on industrial facilities, the energy may only be two to three cents a kilowatt hour and your demand charges may be $20 a kilowatt. And the solar array and the battery comes and shaves off the, the, the peak demand, and your savings come from the $20 a kilowatt, but you're also left over with dirt cheap electricity. Well, one thing you can do with dirt cheap electricity is mine Bitcoin, which is a way of converting electricity into money. And so if I'm a, a community solar developer and I'm looking at an industrial site and I say, okay, I can reduce my demand by that much, I also have access to this much free or avoided cost electricity. And so not only am I trying to reduce the demand, I'm also trying to fill in the valleys. And I can do that in a profitable manner with Bitcoin mining. And so it might be that, you know, under a community solar model, the developer comes in and they put in the solar peaker battery and then they get all their capital back by adding the community solar layer to it. And then on top of that, they've secured access to the cheapest electricity in the United States for Bitcoin mining. And so it just becomes a all the more profitable project for everybody involved, including the utility, because now the utility will see not you know will not see a, a decrease in energy, but you increase the energy consumption through Bitcoin mining, and uh, and also the, the the demand curve of the of the building then would be perfectly rectangular which is a nice stable demand for the, the grid, for the facility. It optimizes their electric rates. And there's a lot of demand charges that are available. So solar, you know, using a solar battery plus Bitcoin mining, you know, you might go in and what it would look like is you're, you're chopping off 
all of the peak with your solar battery and then coming in and Bitcoin mining up to your new, all the way up to your peak so that your rate structure is perfectly rectangular. And that can add additional projects profitability. Another example would say, well, you know, let's let's buck the trend and rather than doing these very regional specific rate structures, let's start looking internationally. You know, in Mexico, they have a progressive rate structure where most of the people who go solar are paying 20 or 22 cents a kilowatt hour. And you could use, say, uh, the solar coin blockchain to record your energy. And, and, you know, if I'm sitting here in Mississippi and I'm only getting avoided cost rates for solar buyback, it would actually be more profitable for me to, to buy into a community solar project in Mexico than it would be to pay the import tariffs into the United States and uh, participate in Mississippi Power's solar program or lack thereof. And whether or not I'm improving the environment in Mexico versus the U.S., you know, one has one, uh, you know, there is there is a local advantage and that's more of a marketing advantage. But as an individual person, I might be more concerned about the, the financial payback. Um, and then, and then lastly, you know, here I am in, in Tennessee and I have a customer who wants to use his solar array as backup power and, um, and so there's, there's two programs in the TVA. One is the green power provider program where you plug the array directly into the grid and you get about nine cents for it. And then the other program is the Dispersed Power Program, which is a program for, for projects up to 80 megawatts in size. And it's also the same program for doing a three kilowatt roadside connection residential solar array. So the same program for an 80 megawatt project is the same program for a three kilowatt project. And they, they, I talked to the program administrator. There's, there's no, con there's absolutely no contact information of this program administrator on this program. And I talked to her, and and she really gave me the impression that she didn't even want to do residential solar applications because they had no, um, you know, no real uh, procedure in place. You know, they want me to participate in the the buy all sell all program. But that's no longer a good deal for the customers. The customers that I have are more interested in backup power for solar rather than the return on investment. And this program is no longer profitable to participate in. And so, so it, it, it gets into a problem where the, the solar program is no longer valuable, but the regular form of interconnection is not very accessible. And so the solution is, and I, I guess I can't find it on their website, but they say, look, you know, if you don't want to participate in our program, you can come up with your own proposal and let us know what you think. Well, if I'm coming up with my own proposal, I have to track all the energy for it. And so that's where I have this, uh, you know, you get into monitoring systems. So here's a, a service panel monitor called Smappy. And Snappy automatically logs the production to the solar coin blockchain. And so the problem that I talk about, talk with, with uh, local cooperatives in the TVA region is they just don't have any ability to track the energy and outflow. That's not their business. They don't have the personnel. They don't want to do the, the logging. But all of that data logging is necessary for the TVA to compensate the solar owner. So the cooperatives don't want to do it. The TVA needs that data. Well, now there's a, a monitoring system that'll log all the data to the solar coin blockchain. And, um, you know, it's a little, here's my solar coin wallet. Let's see. And so what I have are, are individuals 
who are registering their arrays with me, so I manage their solar coin. But the, the potential is that the TVA has a, another program that's not their dispersed power program for 80 megawatt generators. You know, that's not their residential program that is not very lucrative, that, that, dis, that does not allow load side connections. But then they have a separate program um, for smaller arrays. And the problem is, and this we're going to wrap up pretty quickly here. Let's see if I can find the rate structure here. No. Let's take me one second. Let's see, I can't find about it, but the, the problem is, is the residential program gives you a, a flat rate, and then their next step up for their, their commercial industrial program gives you a time of day variable rate. And so what we're, we're telling them is, look, we don't want the higher residential rate because we want to do a load side connection. At the same time, they're trying to push us into an industrial program that pays less than the commercial and industrial program would. But the problem is the cooperatives can't track the outflow based on time of day. And so what we're working on as a proposal is to use this um, solar coin blockchain where our monitoring system uploads um, our mon the monitoring system uploads hourly production data that's public automatically onto a, a distributed blockchain that is, you know, like my computer right now is helping support the blockchain data. Um, but what that does is it, it, instead of using the utility meters to log hourly production, it uses just on, it uses service panel monitors to upload and monitor hourly outflow production to the web so that at the end of the year, we can provide them with a report of all of our outflow based off the time of day and uh, you know, get, the, get a compensation that is uh, similar to the commercial program and, and a little bit more than the industrial program that we would otherwise participate in. And so while that, that may not make a lot of sense, especially if you're not familiar with blockchain, you now really what I want to bring up is, you know, here I am in Mississippi trying to figure out new ways to grow the market, and there's actually three different versions of community solar that I'm looking at. You know, the first is doing community solar on industrial sites where basically the community solar is serves as a means to cash out the investor up front, but it's all behind the meter doing solar peakers with batteries. The second is using, you know, blockchain and production monitoring to enhance the TVA's existing programs so that they actually have a path forward for load side connection outflow compensation that does not require the cooperative to report the data to the TVA. And the third is international community solar where you have a, a way of verifying the production and permanently recording the production on solar arrays you know in Mexico uh, that generate at a higher rate for a lower cost than they do in the United States thereby being more financially lucrative as an option so that when I go out on a, a sales pitch in Mississippi and my customers say, well, it just doesn't look like it's very worthwhile, instead of being like, yeah, I agree with you, I wish our energy policy wasn't the way it is, uh, instead I can say, 
well, do you want to invest in community solar in Mexico because you can get a much better return on your investment that way? And so, you know, just sitting here as a residential contractor in Mississippi, I already have three different outlets to grow my business using different kinds of community solar. And hopefully this program sheds some light on the, the terms and conditions of community solar and other green transactions so that you can start thinking about that too. So anyway, that's the end of the program. My website is www.community.solar. My email address, I'm just going to put into the chat box. Feel free to email me or uh, join my Google Classroom. With that, we are out of time, so I'm going to pass it back to Tim. Great. Thanks, JR. Thanks, everybody in attendance. I'll close things down. Everybody will be sent over to that brief quiz. Uh, if you don't want to take it now, you'll receive it via email within an hour or so. Um, you, everybody will receive that email, so if you already completed the quiz, you can disregard that email. Um, your certificate should be in your inbox within five to seven business days, barring that we get a quiz back from you. Um, if you have any questions or need anything sooner, certainly call into our office or respond back to any of the emails received about today's webinar, and we can help you out. All right, I'll close things down, and uh, everybody, thank you.